Section 14 of The Man of Genius by Caesar Lombroso. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 4 Political and Religious Lunatics and Mentoids. Part 2 Francis of Assisi, the son of a religious woman. Francis of Assisi was forced to devote himself to business after receiving only the elements of education from the priests of St. Giorgio. Being rich and able to spend money as he pleased, he became the life and soul of the joyous companies of young men, whose custom it was to go about the city by day and night, singing and diverting themselves. He seemed to be the son of a great prince, rather than of a merchant. The citizens of Assisi called him the Flower of Youth, and his companions deferred to him as to their leader he excelled in singing his biographers praise his sweet and powerful voice and was also dexterous in feats of arms when taken prisoner in a skirmish between the burghers of perugia and those of assisi he encouraged his companions in prison and exhorted them to cheerfulness both by word and example his naturally refined and noble disposition was shown both in his persons and manners and in a liberality which delighted in giving to the poor it is said that in his twenty-fourth year a severe illness confined him for a long time to his bed at the beginning of his convalescence he left the house leaning on a stick and stood still to gaze at the beautiful country which surrounded a city but could find no pleasure in it as he had once done from that day forward he was sad and thoughtful he often left his companions and retired to a cave where he spent hours in meditation in order to relieve his sufferings he had recourse to prayer and prayed so fervently that one day he thought he saw before him christ nailed to the cross and felt the passion of christ impressed even upon his bowels upon the very marrow of his bones so that he could not keep his thoughts fixed upon it without being overflowed with grief he was then seen wandering about the fields with his face bathed in tears and when asked whether he felt ill he replied i am weeping for the passion of my lord jesus his friends said to him think of choosing a wife and he replied yes i am thinking of a lady of the noblest the richest the most beautiful that was ever seen who was the lady of his thoughts he revealed on the day when laying aside the dress of his rank he threw a beggar's mantle over his shoulders to the unbound anger of his father who in vain tried to imprison him and to the great scandal of every one by many we read of the fioretti he was thought a fool and as a madman he was mocked and driven away with stones by his relations and by strangers and he suffered patiently all mockery and harsh treatment as though he had been deaf and dumb francis of assisi however was original and great not through those qualities which he had in common with the vulgar herd of ascetics abstinences mortifications prayers ecstasies visions but on account of something which was without his knowing it the very negation of asceticism the affirmation and the triumph of the gentlest and sweetest feelings of humanity the ascent abhorred condemned and fled from nature life all human affections in order to steep himself in solitary contemplation francis by example and precept preached the love of nature concord mutual affections between human beings and work the ascetic called everything beautiful in the world the work of satan francis brought about a true revolution by calling it the work of god praising and thanking god for it it was a new kind of loving and passionate pantheism which inspired him with the soul of the sun in which all creatures animate and inanimate are joined in fraternal embrace in which the beautiful radiant sun the bright and precious moon and stars the wind the clouds the clear sky water useful humble precious and chaste fire shining joyous hardy and strong mother earth who sustains and feeds us together with man who up to that time had been taught to despise everything that might distract him from the selfish thought of his fate in the next world all these are called upon to sing the glory of the lord who is good to bless him for having made the universe so rich varied and beautiful so worthy to be loved if we think of this bold and far-reaching change we shall no longer smile in reading the psalm remembering too that it was the first attempt made by the italian people to express their religious feelings in the vulgar tongue for such a song to burst from the impassioned heart of francis the germs of universal love which he cherished there must already have come to perfect growth he must have freed himself entirely from the ancient terror which in the common superstitious belief peopled woods mountains air and water with hidden enemies 
as also in order to bring men back to mutual love in an age when those whom one wall and one ditch confined gnawed one another he had through his natural tendency to extremes to include not only brother Sire and sister moon but even brother wolf having composed the song francis was so well pleased with it that he had adapted it to a musical melody to order to his disciples and thought of choosing among his followers some who should go about the world singing praises of god and asking as their only recompense that the listeners should repent should call themselves just god's jesters jaculatores domini thus he gave the first and most vigorous impulse to religious poetry in the vulgar tongue luther luther attributed his physical pains and his dreams to the arts of the devil though all those of which he has left us a description are clearly due to nervous phenomena he often suffered e g from an anguish which nothing could lighten caused according to him by the anger of an offended god at twenty-seven he began to be seized with attacks of giddiness accompanied by headaches and noises in the ears which returned to the ages of thirty-two thirty-eight forty and fifty-two especially when he was on a journey at thirty-eight moreover he had a real hallucination perhaps favoured by excessive solitude when in fifteen twenty one he writes i was in my patmos in a room which was entered by no one except two pages who brought me my food i heard one evening after i was in bed nuts moving inside a sack and flying off themselves against the ceiling and all round my bed scarcely had i gone to sleep when i heard a tremendous noise as if many berries were being thrown over i rose and cried who art thou commended myself to christ etc at the church at wittenberg he had just begun explaining the epistle to the romans and had reached the words and just shall live by faith when he felt these ideas penetrate his mind and heard that sentence repeated aloud several times in his ear in fifteen hundred and seven he heard the same words when on his journey to rome and again in a voice of thunder as he was dragging himself up the steps of the scala santa not seldom he confesses as it happened to me to awake about midnight and dispute with satan concerning the mass and he details the many arguments adduced by the devil savannah for the illustration in every respect most apostates if it did not seem almost a national blasphemy to say so is that offered us by savonarola under the influence of a vision he believed himself even from his youth sent by christ to redeem the country from its corruption one day while speaking to a nun it seemed to him that heaven suddenly opened and he saw in a vision the calamities of the church and heard a voice commanding him to announce them to the people the visions of the apocalypse and of the old testament prophets passed in review before him in fourteen ninety one he wished to leave off treating of politics in his sermons i watched all saturday and the whole night but at daybreak while i was praying i heard a voice say fool dost thou not see that god will have thee go on in the same way in fourteen ninety two while preaching during advent he had a vision of a sword on which was written gladius domini super teram suddenly the sword turned towards the earth the air was darkened there was a rain of swords arrows and fire and the earth became a prey to famine and pestilence from this moment he began to predict the pestilence which in fact afterwards came to pass in another vision becoming ambassador of christ he makes a long journey to paradise and there holds discourse with many saints and with the virgin whose throne he describes not forgetting the number of the precious stones with which it is adorned we shall see how a similar scene was described by lazaretti savannah was continually meditating on his dreams and tried to distinguish which among his visions were produced by angels which were the work of demons scarcely ever he is touched by a misgiving that he may possibly be in error in one of his dialogues he declares that to feign one's self a prophet in order to persuade others would be like making god himself an impostor might not be continues the objector that you were deceiving yourself no is the reply i worship god i seek to follow his footsteps it cannot be that god should deceive me yet with contradiction peculiar to unhinged minds he had written a short time before i am not a prophet no the son of a prophet is your sins and make me a prophet before moreover in one page he says that his prophetic illumination is independence of grace whereas a few pages back he had declared that the two were one and the same thing Villari justly remarks that this is the singularity of his character that man who had given to florence the best form of republic who dominated an entire people who filled the world with his eloquence and had been the greatest of philosophers should make it his boast that he had heard voices in the air 
saw the sword of the Lord. But as the same author well concludes, the very puerility of his visions proved that he was the victim of hallucinations, and a still stronger proof of their uselessness, even hurtfulness, as far as he himself was concerned. What need was there? He wished to cheat the masses, to write treaties on his visions, to speak of them to his mother, to write reflections on them on the margins of his Bible, those things which his admirers would have been most eager to hide, those which the simplest intelligence would never have allowed to get into print. These very productions he continued to publish and republish. The truth is that, as he often confessed, he felt an inward fire burning in his bones and forced him to speak and as he was himself swept away by the force of that ecstatic delirium so he succeeded in carrying with him his audience who were moved by his words in a way we find hard to understand when we compare the impression produced with the text of the sermons themselves this helps us to understand how exactly in the same manner as lazaretti had propagated his divine madness among the people not only epidemically by the contagion of ideas but producing actual insanity in persons who, being nearly or quite without education, preached and wrote extempore in consequence of their madness. Thus Domenico Cecchi was the author of the work entitled Sacred Reform, which contained the very just suggestions of relieving the great council from minor business, taxing church property, imposing a single tax and creating a militia, also that of fixing the amount of girls' dowries. In his preface he writes, I set myself with my fancy to make such a work and I can make no other, and by day and night, methinks, I have made such efforts that I might call them miraculous, but has come to pass that I myself stand amazed threat. A certain Giovanni, a Florentine tailor, seized with morbid enthusiasm, wrote Terzine, in which he extolled the future glories of France, and produced verses worthy of Lazaretti. The prophecy is like the following, yet it must needs, that the Pisan shall descend, with irons on his feet, into the sewer, since he has been the cause of so much woe. If I were asked whether, in our asylums, we often meet with types analogous to these, I shall reply that there is, perhaps, not an asylum in Italy which has not received one of these strange lunatics. Cola de Renzi. In 1330, Rome was sinking to chaos. Historians have left us an appalling picture of the disorders of the time, the absence of any regular government and lawless tyranny of the robber barons. The general conditions of the age were favourable to popular movements. King Robert, the protector of the barons, was dead, and Tildy, 1337, Genoa, under Adorno, in 1367, and Florence, 1363, had initiated a democratic regime, which ushered in the terrible Chiompi Revolution of 1378. A premature thriller revolt ran through Europe, and was felt even in feudal monarchical France, where the movement was organised, for a short time, at Paris under Marcel. Under these circumstances, Cola, a young man, born in the Tiber district in 1313, the son of an innkeeper and a washerwoman, or water seller, who thought at first little better than a field labourer, had studied as a notary and acquired a considerable knowledge of the history and antiquities of his country, saw his brother murdered by the wretches who formed the government, or rather the misgovernment of Rome. Then he, who, as the anonymous historian tells us, always had a fantastic smile on his lips, and already, when meditating on ancient books and the ruins of Rome, had often wept, exclaiming, where are the good Romans of the old time? Where is their justice? Was seized, as the was acknowledged, by an irresistible impulse to put into action the ideas which he had acquired from books. In his capacity of notary, he devoted himself to the protection of minors and widows, and assumed the curious title of their consul, just as there were, in his time, consuls of the carpenters, cloth workers, and other guilds. In 1343, in one of the numerous small revolutions of the period, the people had attempted to overthrow the Senate, creating the government of the Thirteen under the papal authority. On that occasion, Coelho was sent as spokesman of the people to Avignon, where he vividly depicted the evils prevalent in Rome, and by his bold and powerful eloquence, amazed and won over the cool-headed prelates, from whom he attained the appointment of notary to the urban chamber in 1344. On his return to Rome, he continued to exercise his office with exaggerated zeal, and got himself called consul, no longer of the windows but of Rome. He excelled others in courtesy, was also inflexible in the administration of justice, and never failed to involve himself in long harangues against those whom he called the dogs of the capital. One day, in a moment of exaggerated fanaticism, he cried to the barons, in full assembly, Ye are evil citizens, ye who suck the blood of the people, and turn to the officials and governors 
he warned them that it was their place to provide for the good of the state the result of this was a tremendous buffet dealt him by a chamberlain of the house of Colonna. he then took matters more calmly and began to depict the former glories and present miseries of rome by means of paintings in which the homicides adulterers and other criminals were represented by apes and cats the corrupt judges and notaries by foxes and the senators and nobles by wolves and bears on another day he exhibited the famous table of Vespasian, and invited the public including the nobles to a dramatic explanation of it he appeared arrayed in a german cloak with a white hood and a hat also wide and surrounded by many crowns one of which was divided in the midst by a small silver sword the interpretation of these grotesque symbols which already indicate his madness the continual use of such being as already stated characteristic of monomaniacs till they end by sacrificing to their passion for symbols the very evidence of the things which they wish to represent is unknown thus applying somewhat after his own fashion the decree of the senate which granted to vespasian the right of making laws at his pleasure of increasing or diminishing the gardens of rome and of italy if he had been a scholar he would have said the area of the roman district and of making and unmaking kings he called on them to consider into what a state they had fallen remember that the jubilee is approaching and that you have made no provision of food or other necessities put an end to your quarrels etc but along with these he delivered other discourses which were to say the least eccentric e g i know that men wish to find a crime in my speeches and that out of envy but thanks to heaven three things consume my enemies luxury envy and fire these two last words were greatly applauded i do not understand them however especially the last i believe that they were applauded precisely because the audience did not understand them as happens to many street orators with whom resonant and meaningless words supply the place of ideas and are even greeted with greater enthusiasm the fact is that among the upper classes he passed for one of those persons of unsound mind who were then in great request for the amusement of society the nobles especially of colonna disputed the pleasure of his company with each other and would tell them the glories of his future government and when i am king or emperor i will make war on all of you i will have such and one hanged and such another beheaded he spared none of them and mentioned them by name one by one to their faces and all the time both nobles and commons he continued to speak of the good state and of how he was going to restore it here i insert a parenthesis it has been said by petrarch in particular that he feigned madness and was a second brutus but when we see his love for pomp luxury strange symbols and garments gradually increasing as he advanced in his political career and after his rise to power we no longer have any doubt as to the reality of his madness he continued to put forth new symbolic pictures among others one with this inscription the day of justice is coming await this moment be it noted that this picture represented a dove bringing a crown of myrtle to a little bird the dove stood for the holy spirit as we shall see one of the favourite objects of his delirium and the bird was himself who was the crown rome of glory at last on the first day of lent 1347 he affixed to the door of san giorgio another placard before long the good state of rome shall be restored not being feared by the nobles who thought him mad he was able to conspire secretly or rather to keep up the ferment of public opinion by taking apart gradually one by one the men who seemed to him best adapted for the purpose and assigning them their posts on mount aventine towards the end of april on a day when the governor was to be absent in this assembly the only one which up to that time had been held in secret the mode of bringing about the good state was deliberated on here we show the eloquence of a man who speaks from conviction and of things which are too true not to produce a deep impression he described the discord of the great the debasement of the poor the iron men roaming about in quest of plunder wives dragged from their marriage beds pilgrims murdered at the gates priests drowned in sensual orgies no strength or wisdom among those who held the reins of power from the nobles there was everything to fear and nothing to hope where were they in the midst of all these disorders they were leaving rome to enjoy a holiday on their estates while everything was going to wreck and ruin in the city as the members of the popular party were hesitating for want of funds he gave them a hint that these might be obtained from the revenues of the apostolic chamber reckoning ten thousand florins 
for the tax on salt alone, 100,000 for the hearth tax, figures which Sismondi, chapter 38, declares to be absolutely erroneous. He also gave them to understand that he was acting in accordance with the wishes of the Pope, which was false, and that he was able, with the consent of the letter, to seize upon the revenues of the Holy See. On May 18, 1347, in Colonna's absence, he had proclamation made through the streets by sound of trumpet that all citizens were to assemble in the night of the day following, in the church of St. Angelo, to take measures for the establishment of the good state. On the 19th, Rienzi was present at the meeting, in armour, guarded by a hundred armed men, and accompanied by the papal vicar, and by three standards covered with the most extraordinary symbols, one of them representing liberty, one justice, and one peace. Among the measures which he caused to be adopted by this improvised assembly were some which would be well suited to our own times. The following, for instance, all authors were to be terminated within fifteen days. The apostolic chamber was to provide for the support of widows and orphans. Every district of Rome was to have a public granary. If a Roman were killed in the service of his country, his heir is to receive a hundred lira if he were a foot soldier, and a hundred florins if a horseman. The garrison of cities and fortresses to be formed of men chosen from among the Roman people. Every accuser who could not make good his accusation to be subject to the penalty which his victim would have incurred. The houses of the condemned not to be destroyed, as was then the case in all communities, but to become the property of the municipality. Call had received from this popular assembly entire lordship over the city. He associated the papal vicar with himself as a harmless assistant, and taught himself tribune, and performed an actual miracle in restoring peace where there had been chaos. He saw the proud barons, even the rebellious and powerful prefect of Vico, prostrate at his feet. He executed severe justice upon the most powerful nobles as well as the populace. Members of the Orsini, Savelli, and Gaetani families were hanged by him for violation of the laws, and was more, even priests such as the Marcus St. Anastasius, who was accused of several murders. By means of the so-called Tribunal of Peace, he reconciled with each other 1,800 citizens who had previously been mortal enemies. He abolished, or more accurately speaking, tried to abolish, the servile use of the title Don, which is still rampant among us in the South. He prohibited dicing, concubinage, and fraud in the sale of provisions, which last was the measure which conduced most to his popularity. Finally, he recreated a true citizen militia, a real national guard. He caused the Estusians of the nobles to be erased from all palaces, equipages, and banners, saying that there was to be in Rome no other lordship than the Pope's and his own. He re-established a tax on every hearth in all the towns and villages of the Roman district, and was obeyed even by the Tuscan communities who might have claimed exemption. The collectors were not sufficient for the work. All the governors, except two, submitted, and he finally appointed a kind of justice of the peace, to decide even criminal cases. He did even more. He was the first to conceive, what even Dante had not thought of, and at least neither Goeuf nor Gobelin, under the headship of the Roman municipality, in which, like Marcel of Paris, he attempted to assemble a true national parliament. He was the first man in Italy to think of this, and was only understood by thirty-five communes. At Avignon, finally, he was able to archive what I consider his greatest enterprise, to gain himself pardoned after a course of speech and action so hostile to the papal court, by those who never pardoned, the clergy of their ferocious and implacable age, and not only pardoned, but sent back, through a short period in which an inferior capacity, to a position fraught with the greatest dangers to that order. But all these miracles, alas, lasted for only a few days only. The man who, in his political ideas, surpassed not only his contemporaries, but many modern thinkers, and preceded Mazzini, and Cavour to the idea of unity, was in fact a monomaniac, as is recorded by the historians Re and Papincourt. If he was great in conception, he was uncertain and incapable of practical matters. This is fully shown, e.g., when, though he had his greatest enemy, the prefect of Vico, in his hands, he let him go, keeping his son as a hostage, and when he failed to profit by his unexpected victory over the barons, always incapable of taking any resolution which is not merely theoretical. He believed that everything he did was done by the grace of the Holy Spirit. Under his auspices, we have seen that he began his enterprise. He was still further confirmed in his delusion by a heresy which had then recently sprung up, according to which the Holy Spirit was to regenerate the world, and especially by the fact 
very significant in itself that a dove alighted near him while he was showing the people one of his allegorical pictures to this dove he attributed his successful beginning as he ascribed to his prophetic inspiration the victory over the coluna and that over the prefect in the most important affairs he believed that he heard in himself through the medium of a dream or other sign the voice of god with whom he took counsel and to whom he referred everything sustained by the prestige of this inspiration he furthermore enacted religious laws e g one compelling confession once a year and a pain of confiscation to the extent of one-third of a man's property he did not fail to exhibit the usual contradictions peculiar to the insane very religious himself he had no hesitation in comparing himself to christ only on account of the coincidence implied in his having gained a victory at the age of thirty-three after his debate he again compared himself to him in a play upon numbers such as is common among the insane because he was for thirty-five months an exile in the magella in a wild and lonely hermitage surrounded by several persons subject to hallucinations followers of the holy spirit who prophesied that he would once more be victorious and even rule over the whole world the megalomaniac delirium which usually prevailed in his case explains the greater part of these contradictions he believed that in his own person was centred all the hopes of the messiah of italy who was to restore the roman empire nay even redeem the world in a moment when he must have thought himself near death in the prison of prague he thought himself the victim of diabolical imaginations or believed that he was obeying the will of heaven thus he wrote i kiss the key of the prison as if it were the gift of god one day he arose from the throne and advancing towards with faithful followers said in a loud voice we command pope clement to present himself before our tribunal and to live at rome and we give the same command to the college of cardinals we decide to appear before us the two claimants charles of bohemia and ludwig of bavaria who take upon themselves the title emperors we command all the electors of germany to inform us on what pretext they have usurped the inalienable right to the roman people the ancient and legitimate sovereigns of the empire then he drew his sword waved three times towards the three divisions of the known world and said three times in a transport of ecstasy this too belongs to me all this because he had bathed in the porphyry basin of constantine to the great scandal of his followers and believed that he had thus succeeded to the power of that emperor while he was going on this course the papal legate by whose concurrence alone all these eccentricities could not to a certain point be justified protested with all the force his slight degree of energy would allow it would be pretty much as if the council of san marino were to take it into his head on the strength of majority of votes or because he had worn a hat belonging to napoleon the first that he could summon before his tribunal the emperors of austria germany and russia with a few dukes into the bargain and this would appear ridiculous in our own times when in theory at least right is stand above might what must it have seemed in that age nor was this a mere momentary aberration we still possess the diplomatic communication dated august twelfth destined for the emperors after that mad theatrical ceremony i extract some passages in virtue of the same authority and of the favour of god the holy spirit and the roman people we say protest and declare that the roman empire the election jurisdiction and monarchy of the sacred empire belong by full right to the city of rome and to all italy for many good reasons which we shall mention at the proper place and time after having summoned the dukes kings etc to appear between this day and that of the pentecost next following before us in st john the Terran, with their titles and claims failing which on the expiry of their term they will be proceeded against according to the forms of law and the inspiration of the holy spirit moreover he adds as though he had not yet expressed himself clearly enough besides what has been heretofore said in general and in particular we cite in person the illustrious princes louis duke of bavaria and charles duke of bohemia calling themselves emperors or elected to the empire and besides these the duke of saxony the marquis of brandenburg etc that they may appear in the said place before us in person and before other magistrates failing which we shall proceed against them as contumacius etc this was too much the mutual animosity of the colonna and the orsini was momentarily suspended they united their forces to combat him openly and conspire against him in secret an assassin sent by them to attempt the tribune's life was arrested when put to the torture accused the nobles from that instant rienzi incurred the fate of a tyrant and adopted tyrant's suspicions and rules of conduct 
Shortly afterwards, under various pretexts, he invited to the capital his principal enemies, among whom were many of the Orsini and three of the Colonna. They arrived, believing themselves, called to a council banquet, and Rienzi, after inviting them to take their place at table, had them arrested. Innocent and guilty had to undergo this terror alike. After the people had been summoned to the spot by the sound of the great bell, they were accused of a conspiracy to assassinate Renzi, and not a single voice or hand was raised to defend the heads of the nobility. They passed the night in separate rooms, and Stefano Colonna, battering at his prison door, several times entreated that he might be freed by a swift death from so humiliating a position. The arrival of a confessor and the sound of the funeral bell showed them what was awaiting them. The great hall of the capital, where the trial was to take place, was hung with white and red, as was usual when a death sentence was about to be pronounced. All seemed ready for their condemnation, when the tribune, touched by fear or pity, after wrong speech to the people, in their defence, caused them to be acquitted, and even granted them some offices, such as the prefecture of arms, which could not fail to be formidable weapons against him. It was not the sort of thing which was done in those days, and even Petra thought he had been too lenient, while the lower classes expressed their sense of his folly in a coarse and more energetic fashion. Such was his madness, says the anonymous historian, that he allowed his enemies to entrench themselves afresh, and then sent a messenger to summon them to his presence. The messenger was wounded, whereupon he summoned them a second time, then had two of them painted, hanged head downward. They, in their turn, took the town of Nepi from him, for which he could devise no other retribution than the drowning of two dogs supposed to represent them. After the bloodless and useless marches, he returned to Rome, and, having put on the Dalmatica of the emperors, had himself crowned for the third time. Worse still, he had the same time expelled the papal legate, Bertrando, thus throwing away his last anchor of safety at the moment when he needed it most. Besides the eccentricity of his consecration as knight of the Holy Spirit, preceded by the bath in the vase of Constantine, which though it can readily be explained by the ideas of the period, did him serious injury in the estimation of the majority, and especially the religious, as being an act of profanation. He was guilty of the egregious political folly of declaring that, after that ceremony, the Roman people had returned to the full possession of that jurisdiction over the world, that Rome was the head of the world, and the monarch of the empire, and the election of the emperors, were privileges of the city, of the Roman people, and of Italy. This is clearly a declaration of war against both Pope and Emperor. Later on, on August 15th, with his usual monomanic tendency to symbolism, he crowned himself with six wreaths of different plants, either because he loved religion, myrtle because he honoured learning, partly because of its resistance to poison, as the emperor was supposed to resist the malevolence of his enemies. To these he added, no discoverable reason, the metra of the Trojan king and a silver crown. All this proves, says Gregorovius, that it was his intention to get himself crowned emperor. As it was the custom of the Roman emperors to promulgate edicts after their coronation, so he, immediately after this ceremony, by political decrees, confirmed to the whole of Italy the right of Roman citizenship. Alberto Argentaro, as that he threatened Pope Clement with deposition, if he did not return to Rome within the year, and that he would have elected another Pope. Villani says that he wished to reform the whole of Italy in the ancient manner, and subject it to the dominion of Rome. To understand how truly insane was this project, it must be remembered that his sacred militia, that which he believed most faithful, numbered no more than 1,600 men, and the whole army, counting both horse and foot, did not, on an outside calculation, exceed 2,000. After defeating the nobles, without any merit on his part, he, who had formerly been so generous, forbade the widows to weep for the dead, and was guilty of words and actions which, even in the ferocious age, struck his sacred knights, as he called them, as so barbarous and foolish that they refused to bear arms for many longer. From this moment date, on one hand, his undoubted insanity, on the other, the contempt of all honourable men, vigorously expressed by Petrarch himself in a well-known letter. It can now be understood why he was, even from the time of his first exploits, so fond of pompous titles. After calling himself Consul of the Windows and Consul of Rome, he adopted the title of Tribune, which afterwards became Clement and Severe Tribune, the contradiction being nothing to him, so long as he could suggest the name of Servius Boethius, whose arms he had also adopted. And, not long after this, 
referring with that kind of play upon words so dear to the insane and to idiots to his nomination in august august tribune we can also comprehend that stripped of all his power an exile and a prisoner he should have turned to the prosaic emperor charles fourth telling him his dreams as we shall see with complete confidence in their reality at rome after his first fall which was perhaps one cause of the indulgence with which he was treated by the pope there had been a new outburst of disorder which a tribune who has remained almost unknown one baron Celli, in vain endeavoured to stem nor did renzi himself meet with any better success on his return shorn of his ancient prestige and without that youthful audacity which united to a maniacal erethism has increased the strength of the poor scholar a hundredfold and he was overthrown by the populace themselves for men whether madmen of genius or complete geniuses have no power against the natural force of things marcel had no success at paris though he had far greater force at his disposal and was allied with the chacori of the country districts but rienzi could not even succeed in realizing the prodigies of insane genius since he had by this time fallen to true dementia it appears that in the early stages of his government he was a sober and temperate man so much so that he had to make an effort to find time to eat from this he passed to the opposite extreme of continuous orgies and actual dipsomania which excused by alleging the effects of a poison which he believed to have been administered to him in prison i believe on the contrary that this phenomenon was occasioned by the progress of his malady since we see that it began in the early months of his first tribunate and since slow poisons produce emaciation not obesity in their victims at every hour he was eating dainties and drinking he observed neither time nor order he mixed greek with flavian wine he drank new wine at any hour he used to drink too much moreover he had now become enormously stout he had a face like a friar round and jovial as that of a bonze a ruddy complexion and a long beard his eyes were white and suddenly he would turn red as blood and his eyes would become inflamed in short as is usually the case with persons inclined to dementia his body became enormous and his eyes were often bloodshot while his face acquired an entirely brutal cast of expression his mind was much less active and his temper fundamentally changed while the fickleness restlessness and oddity which had served to excite great admiration for him in the mind of the populace now had so degenerated as to redound to his injury those who saw most of him said that he changed his mind as well as his expression of face from one minute to the next and was never constant to the same thought of a quarter of an hour together thus he began the siege of palestrina and then abandoned it he would appoint a skilful commander and then cashier him in later times when he was forced to impose taxes on wine and salt even for the poor he restrained his luxurious tendencies and became apparently temperate but his other evil propensities did not change to the intermittent generosity of which he had given proofs in his early period succeeded a cold selfishness which excited horror even in that cruel age where for instance he had fra monreal beheaded for not repaying a sum of money which reigns he had lent him his friend pandolfono padolfini respected in all rome as a model of an honourable man was beheaded by him without a shadow of a reason merely for envy of his reputation thus he sacrificed or despoiled of their property the best men in the country and passed from the extreme of timidity to that of ferocity he was seen to laugh and weep almost at the same time in both cases without sufficient cause his paroxysms of joy were followed by sighs and tears but it is chiefly in his letters that the whole of his genius and that of his madness is revealed the letters of cola di renzi were sought for and collected with singular curiosity as though petrarch several times writes to him they had fallen from the antipodes or the sphere of the moon for collections of his letters are extant at mantua at turin twenty-two closely written pages at paris and at florence the last same being autographs they have been published and republished by gay de Sade, hobhouse oximior peluzel and papincourt and would by themselves be sufficient material on which to base a diagnosis in fact there is not one of them which does not bear the impress either of a morbid vanity or of those trivial repetitions and plays upon words especially characteristic of the insane the first point to note is their great abundance in an age when very little was written when his residence in the capital was sacked after his first flight what most surprised those who entered his private office was the mass of letters which had been drafted and never sent it was well known that the numerous staff of clerks employed by him 
could not keep pace with the amount of matter he dictated, and that he was continually sending couriers not only to friendly republics, but to indifferent or hostile potentiates, like the King of France, is a digesting reply by an archer, a functionary somewhat analogous to a modern policeman. Thus, too, the lords of Ferrara, Mantua, and Padua returned him his letters. Add to this their style, their exaggerated length, the addition of postscripts longer than the letter itself, and the singular signature, richer in laudatory titles than was ever used except by Oriental princes. These letters have, indeed, a flavour of their own, a vivacity breaking loose from the restraints of the classical writers who served as his, his models, an exuberant self-confidence which at first sight obliged the reader to put faith in the falsehoods with which they swarmed. Nay, it seems that, as happens with some lunatics and some incorrigible liars, he ended by himself believing in his own functions. Leaving aside many strange blunders, surprising in a Latin scholar, and the prolixity already mentioned, without dwelling on the very undiplomatic want of delicacy present to a morbid extent, and all the more surprising in a statesman of that age, when reserve was more general than at present, one fact particularly strikes me, an inveterate habit of punning, a symptom of extreme frivolity, which was certain not a characteristic of medieval diplomacy. What man in his senses would, even in the depths of the Dark Ages, have written as he did to Pope Clement, in the letter dated August 5th, 1347? The grace of the Holy Spirit having freed the republics under my rule, and my humble person having been, at the beginning of August, promoted to the militia, there is attributed to me, as is the signature, the name of the title of August. Give as above on the 5th of August. Humble creature, candidate of the Holy Spirit, Niccolo the Severe and Clement, liberator of the city, zealous for Italy, lover of the world, who kisses the feet of the blessed. Note that, after all this signature, the letter goes on for three pages more, on much more serious topics, which he had postponed the pun on August. In this respect, a clear proof of his insanity is to be found in the letter which he wrote in the elation of his victory over the barons, not to dwell on the strange familiarity with the deity which he shows when he writes that God formed to war those fingers which had been trained to the use of the pen, whereas, as a matter of fact, he had no knowledge whatever of the art of war. It is well to note that among his gravest charges against the Colonna was that of their having sacked a church where he had deposited his golden crown. Still more strange is the following claim to prophecy addressed to the clergy, who, as dealing in such matters, are likely to be most sceptical concerning them. We should not forget to tell you that, two days before these occurrences, we had a vision of Pope Boniface, who foretold our triumph over those tyrants. We made a report thereof in full season, and the presence of the assembled Romans, and going into St. Peter's to the altar of St. Boniface, we present to him a chalice and a veil. This vision, at last, thanks to heaven, was fulfilled, thanks to the help of the blessed Martin, his tribune. Here he forgets that two pages previously in the same letter, he had attributed his victories to St. Lawrence and St. Stephen. As his traitors, he continues, had plundered the pilgrims on the day of his festival, that saint took vengeance on them by the hand of a tribune three days afterwards, this is to say, on the day of St. Columba, who glorified the dove, Columba, of our flag. Note the puns in the above. He concludes with some of those postscripts which are so frequent in the letters of monomaniacs and are found in nearly all of his. Given at the capital on the very day of the victory, the 3rd of November, on which day there persisted six tyrants of the house of Colonna, and none remained but the unhappy old man Stefano Colonna, who is half dead. He is the seventh, and this is how heaven was willing to make the number of the slain Colonna equal the crowns, sick, of our coronation, and the branches of the fruit-bearing tree, which recall the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Absolute insanity is shown, both in the idea and the word, in which he makes the deity intervene to extinguish a family of heroes for the sake of a sinister freak of language, in order the man who, a few pages previously, with a hypocrisy soon believed by facts, had ridden. Consistently with our character, we were not willing to employ the severity of the sword, ever just, against those whom we might bring back to grace, who had injury to freedom, justice, and peace. Both comic and insane is the way in which, in another letter to Rinaldo Orsini, September 22, 1347, he tries to disguise, by a number of useless fictions, the enormous error of which he had been guilty in setting at liberty the nobles arrested shortly before. We wish that your paternity should know how, having judged certain nobles, lawfully suspected by the people and by us, 
it pleased god that they should fall into our hands we see on the contrary that he had expressly invited them we caused them to be shut up in the dungeons of the capital but finally our scruples and suspicions having been removed we made use of an innocent artifice sick, to reconcile them not only with ourselves but with god wherefore we procured them the happy opportunity of making a devout confession it was on the fifteenth september that we sent confessors to each of them in prison and as the latter were ignorant of our good intentions and believed that we were going to be severe they said to the nobles the lord tribune will condemn you to death meanwhile the great bell of the capital tolled without ceasing for the assembly and thus the terrified nobles gave themselves up for lost and in the expectation of death confessed devoutly and with tears i then made a speech in praise of them etc let the reader judge of the condition of the moral sense in a man who could write thus it should be noted besides that diplomatically an excuse of this sort especially in dealing with priests who being in the trade so to speak would know its exact value would not only be useless but even constitute a serious accusation nor is his conclusion less strange with all their hearts are so united to ours and to those of the people that this union must last for the good of our country because thus they see that we are impartial and do not wish to be as severe as we might be but his useless hypocrisies do not end there the confusion of the patricians probably suggested the order already mentioned that all citizens were to confess and receive the communion at least once a year under pain of losing a third of their goods half of the forfeited property go to the parish church of the defendant the other to the city and the notaries were obliged to act as spies for every testator now reigns he in a postscript to the above letter and i repeat that i have frequently observed in monomaniacs this fad of postscripts occurring at the end of letters gives notice of his new edict adding it seems most fitting that as a second augustus provides for the temporal profit of the republic he should also seek to favour and promote its spiritual welfare this if one thinks about it was a reservation of the special rights and duties of the pontiff even according to the most modern view of them as also when he prescribed the clergy's special ceremonies and ecclesiastical processions of his own invention and enacted decrees against the members of religious orders who should fail to return to rome this in fact was one of the principal accusations and just one levelled against him at prague headed a vignon and one which he only rebutted by false statements elsewhere he speaks of being inspired by the holy spirit with a confidence which would be altogether unintelligible except in a man who was perfectly sincere and therefore under the influence of hallucination a glance at other letters explains at once that the bath in the bays of constantine was for him what the tattooed marks on his forehead were to lazaretti one of those symbolic freaks to which the insane attach peculiar significance in fact a kind of imperial investiture a long letter charles the fourth written from prison in july thirteen fifty dwelling on a supposed intrigue of his mother with the emperor henry the seventh bears in subject matter and style the unmistakable impress of insanity a little later august fifteenth thirteen fifty we find him writing to the emperor another letter full of senseless puns in which he tells him with doubly absurd freaks of thought and language how in the idea that the mother of servinius boethius was descended from the kings of bohemia and he called boethius the younger and himself the severe and how, how he had adopted from them the device of the seven stars manners which could neither interest the emperor nor be of advantage to himself but have all the characteristics of insanity so also when he wrote that he was persuaded by the prophecies of the mangilla hermits already mentioned that his second exaltation should be more than glorious than the first as the sun long hidden by the clouds appeared more beautiful into the eye of the beholder perhaps the lord justly indignant at the wicked and unheard of murder of rienzi's illustrious grandfather henry the seventh and the losses in souls and bodies suffered by the world during the interregnum he raised up choler for the advantages of charles chosen him to re-establish the empire and ordained that he should be baptized in the Lateran, in the church of the baptist and the bath of constantine that he might be the forerunner of the emperor as john the baptist was of christ charles it is true has said that the empire could only be restored by a miracle but was not this miracle that one poor man should be able to succour the falling empire as st francis had succoured the church let him awake and gird on his sword let him not count for anything the revelation of the friars since the whole old and new testaments were full of revelations 
he could alone become master of rome if he did not do so at once charles would lose at least one hundred thousand gold florins from the tax on salt and the other revenues in the city which had been increased by the approach of the jubilee within a year and a half the pope should die and many cardinals be slain in fifteen years there should be put one shepherd and one faith and the new pope the emperor charles the college should be as it were a symbol of the trinity on earth charles should reign in the west the tribune in the east for the present he was content with supporting the emperor in his journey to rome he was willing to open the way for him with the romans and other peoples of italy who would otherwise be averse to the empire so that charles might come along them peaceably and without bloodshed and his arrival should not be the signal for mourning to the city and the whole nation as had that of former emperors so far did he go that the archbishop of prague wrote to him that he wondered how the tribune who had done things which at first appeared to come from god could be so far from exercising the virtue of humility as to consider his own revelation the work of the holy spirit and to call himself the candidate of the latter words which may well be noted by those who see in his madness only the effect of the superstitions of the period the emperor replied with much common sense advising him to cease from ignorant hermits who think themselves to be walking in the spirit of humility without being able even to resist their sins and save their own souls and to speak fantastically of knowing in the things and governing in the spirit all that is under heaven and telling him that out of love to god and his neighbours he has caused thee to be imprisoned with a so of tars and withal out of love for thine own soul to cure it let already consoles him to lay aside all the vagaries and whatever his origin may have been to remember that we are all god's creatures sons of adam made out of the earth etc a curious lesson democracy given by a king of bohemia to the ex-tribune of an italian republic but all was useless and when after many vicissitudes he once more acquired a shadow of his former power by the aid of money obtained by sheer trickery he announced the fact of florence in a pompous proclamation adding that women men boys priests and lay folk had gone to meet him with palms and olive branches and trumpets and cries of welcome these speeches seem so very extravagant that their genuineness has been doubted by zeferino re or the account of the extreme improbability of petrarch's having defended him or the emperor regarded him with favour for a single moment had he really entertained ideas so eccentric and heretical but that however improbable such is the fact is already evident a priori to any one who even without examining these strange letters and still stranger circulars has observed the progressive development of insanity in Cole's career and knows that it was just through his unheard-of audacity that he triumphed and that the bohemians were not so much scandalized as struck dumb by his eloquence and afterwards astonished and deeply moved by his recantations moreover these writings were refuted by the bohemian bishops in a document which is still extant afterwards retracted by himself with the delicacy of which historians have not taken sufficient account they were not consigned to their entirety to the papal court along with the person of the tribune whose condemnation indeed could bring neither pleasure nor profit to the host who had been already forced by political considerations to betray the confidence reposed in him he remained meanwhile an isolated phenomenon an enigma to historians since it was not so much history as the science of mental pathology which could succeed in completely explaining him that science has pointed out to us in rienzi all the characteristics of the modern maniac regular features in handwriting exaggerated tendency to symbolism and plays upon words an activity disproportioned to his social position and original even in absurdity which entirely exhausted itself in writing an exaggerated consciousness of his own personality which at first aided him with the populace and supplant the want of tact and practical ability but which led him into absurdities a defective moral sense a calm marking the approach to dementia which was only disturbed by the abuse of alcohol or by a spirited opposition campanella if cola da Rienzi was a strange problem for historians until resolved by the modern psychiatric studies on monomania not less strange has been the problem presented by campanella who from being a humble and disdained monk in a forgotten district of calabria claimed to be a monarch and as it were a demigod against the power of spain and of the pope and then suddenly became and died a zealot for both contradicting himself even against his own advantage certainly against that of his fame at last it seems to me the problem is approaching solution after the classical works of badacchino of spaventa of fiorentino but above all of 
amabile especially since carlo Folletti has passed those powerful works through the alembic of his synthetic criticism and removed from this strange metal the stains deposed by legends and historical prejudices campanella remarks Folletti, with his badly formed skull surmounted by seven inequalities hills as he himself called them possessed most sensitive nerves an acute intellect and easily exalted emotions the mystical education of the order to which he belonged completed the work of nature having entered a dominican monastery at the age of fourteen he always lived outside the real world he spent eight years in the schools of calabria amid disputes with his masters and fellow pupils and then departed almost fled from cosenza and went to naples no good fortune met him there soon after his arrival he chanced to speak slightly of excommunication he was at once denounced imprisoned taken to rome tried and condemned on leaving prison he decided to go to padua on the way he was robbed of his manuscripts three days after reaching padua he was accused of using violence against the general of the dominicans and some fresh imprisonment and fresh trial discharged and set at liberty he took part in public discussions but the doctrines he openly professed led to another trial and imprisonment he was only twenty-six and already spent three years in prison at the age of twenty in the monastery of cosenza campanella had associated with a certain abremo from whom he received lessons in necromancy and who predicted that he would one day be king this was the starting point of his wild and ambitious imaginations it should be added that when studying astrology especially in fifteen ninety seven he talked with many astrologers mathematicians and prelates who all held that the end of the world was approaching excited by their arguments he gave himself to the study of prophecy seeking it in the bible the fathers and the poets of antiquity and the symbols of the white horses and the white-robed elders of the new zion he saw the brothers of saint dominic convinced that the prediction of the holy republic referred to the dominicans he retired to stillo all the political and social disorders of his time were for campanella manifest signs and to these were added earthquakes famines floods and comets evidently the prophecies were being fulfilled no doubt sixteen hundred was the fatal year which would indicate the beginning of great changes and revolutions campanella spread the prophecies and prepared the ground for the holy republic there can be no question that these predictions and preparations led to a real rebellion because they fitted in with the miserable conditions of calabria such prophecies pleased many who cherished desires of revenge in the ears of these exasperated people campanella's words sounded like a call to rebellion maurizio di rinaldi the leader of the band so understood it as did other bandits rinaldi cared little for religious reforms and knew nothing of what the seven seals of the apocalypse signified he understood however that his arm was needed and persuaded that it was not possible to fight against spain with writings and words and the weapons of brigands he sought the aid of the turks he was a real rebel the real matter in the liberation of calabria from subjection to spain of all the chief persons concerned in this disturbance he alone confessed himself a rebel the others either denied the existence of a rebellion or professed their innocence seeing the old world doubled by the discovery of new lands and europe turned upside down by wars campanella thought of a universal monarchy with the pope and himself for king and pastor turn to his utopia of the city of the sun which all are educated in common all the solarians call each other brother they are all sons of the great father adorned on the summit of the mountain on which the city is built there is not and cannot be among them any selfishness all consider the common good and under the guidance of the priest and head live happily together since all are instructed and knowledge is the foundation of every honour there is no noble strife of intelligence the Salarian citizens have made wonderful progress in the arts and sciences. They have ships that plough the seas without sails and without oars, and cars that are propelled by the force of the wind. They have discovered how to fly, and they are inventing instruments which will reveal new stars. They know that the world is a great animal in whose body we live, that the sea is produced by the sweat of the earth, and that all the stars move. They practice perpetual adoration, offer bloodless sacrifices and reverence, but do not worship the sun and the stars all this simplicity happiness and prosperity are due in the first place to education and to communism and in the second place to the magistrates who are all priests the spiritual and temporal head is Hoc, who is assisted by pom sim and moor pom has charge of all that refers to war sim presides over the arts industries and instruction 
Moore directs human generation and the education of children. He regulates the sexual relationships in order to produce healthy and robust offspring, and he permitted the strong to procreate. The rest are allowed to sacrifice to the terrestrial Venus after fecundation has been ascertained. The city of the sun is not in favour of war, but has not refused to fight. In battle the citizens are invincible because they fight in defence of their country, natural law, justice and religion. The felicity of the city of the sun is rested therefore a community of goods of women of pleasures and of knowledge on wholesome generation on sacerdotal government and on simplicity in religion campanella aimed at founding the calabria a facsimile of the city of the sun the whole of his trial of heresy showed that he wished to reform religion and render it more in harmony with human nature by his own confession it is proved that he wished to establish a sacerdotal government no other affirms in fact that he aimed to become king of calabria in order to extend his authority thence over the whole world capital's mind was in such condition that it may be held with amabile that he saw the possibility of founding a republic similar to that described in the city of the sun naturally the head of this little holy republic the hawk of the city of the sun would be a philosopher and therefore himself all nations observing the felicity and enjoy by the citizens of the new scion would accept the new law and thus capitola would become the monarch and guide of the world only a lunatic would consider it possible to undertake the reorganization of society at a stroke abimis fundamentalis changing the form of government and overturning the most ancient customs institutions laws and traditions but the madness diminishes if this reorganization is a consequence of a profound and general upheaval like the proclaimed by the prophets for the end of the world in his writings certainly we find puerilities which go to prove insanity if he had been an ordinary man they would not be remarkable they would harmonize with the common prejudice of the day but he had broken with theology and undertaken to examine its ratio he had caught a glimpse of the modern state and he proposed reforms which for his time were most liberal and remarkable thus he writes law is a consent of all written and promulgated for the common good a poll thirty two the law should establish equality i bid forty the laws should be such that the people can obey them with love and fear. Mon di Spagna. C. 11. Heavy taxes should be levied on articles that are not necessary and are of luxury, the light ones on necessaries. B. 2. Doc. 197. Page 91. There should be unity of government. Mon di Spagna. C. 12. The barons should be deprived of their just carcerandi. I bid C. 14. They should be defied of fortresses. I bid. The national army should be established. Education should be free. I bid. Medical aid should be gratuitous. B. 2. Doc. 97. Page 82. In fact, Capnella proposed what Sully, Reculo, Colbert, and Louis XIV did for the French nation. Now, when a man who reasons so profoundly fails to see the absurdity and impossibility of becoming, with a few followers, in a remote country style, the monarch and reformer of the whole world, he can only be insane, and so he was judged by the more sagacious among his contemporaries. Thus Father Giacinto, the confident Reculo, wrote, No one believes so easily in his story that is told him, and examines things that he believes to be de facto with less judgment. And again, I shall always hold him for a man wilder than a fly, less sensible in worldly affairs than a child. Pedro called him Bonhomme. Following human intellect, Cavanella reached pantheism, the soul of things, the transformation of animate and inanimate beings, veneration of the sun, the beneficent star, living temple, statue, and venerable face of the true God. Stricken by adversity, not assisted by his God, he returned to Catholicism, to the angels and miracles, to the future life, which promises enjoyments which cannot be had on earth, and the restoration of the beloved lost like all madmen incapable of moderation he became furiously intolerant hence his ferocious suggestions for oppressing the protestants and the title which he took of emissary of christ or of the most high he imagined that his works would serve to confute the protestants wrote and disputed against lutherians and calvinists wished to find colleges of priests for the diffusion of catholicism gave advice to those who would none of it for overthrowing heresy and propagating the true faith in short he ended as he had begun and delirious dream of religious ambition which only varied in subject going from one pole to the opposite
but I repeat, this phenomenon of contradiction, and on the passage from opposite excesses of feeling, is one of the most marked characters of monomania, and especially religious monomania. I remember nuns of whom I had charge at the asylum of Pesaro, who, on first becoming insane, were violent and blasphemous, and later on, in the course of their madness, apostles of Christianity, and thus it is easy to see what the misery may, at the influence of insanity, develop extraordinary prodigality. We have seen Lazaretti, a drunkard and a blasphemer, become austere and pious under the influence of insanity, and then from being a fanatical papist, becoming and dying an anti-papist, when he found himself repulsed by the Vatican. Recently, Dindino, in his book, Il Messiae Degli Abruzzi, had described a certain priest, become a messiah, who, while insane, attempted reforms at all events and rites, and he during the last month of his life, like Campanella, starred himself in penitence for his revolutionary sins, and in spite of farce and penances, believed that he was damned. End of section 14《Section 15 of the Man of Genius by Caesar Lombroso. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 4 Political and Religious Lunatics and Metoids. Part 3 San Juan de Dios. Juan Suidad was born on March 8, 1495, in the town of Montemoro. Or novo in portugal he seems to have been tormented by the spirit of adventure from his childhood as he left his father's house at the age of eight a priest took him as far as oropesa where he entered the service of a frenchman in the capacity of shepherd after some years he became tired of his work and being tall and strong enlisted as a soldier the life he led in the army cannot be described the officers set the example and plundered as greedily as the privates one of the former entrusted his share of the booty to Juan, who either lost it or stole it. He was condemned to death, and was just going to be hanged when a superior officer passing by granted him his life, but dismissed him from the army. He then returned to Oropesa, and resumed his former position. Towards 1528 he enlisted a second time, and marched under the orders of the Count of Oropesa. When the war was over, he returned to Montemor, or Novo, to see his parents but he lost his memory and forgot his father's name. He then left the place and went to Ayamonte in Andalusia, where he became a shepherd. It was there that he believed himself to have been called, and later on, to have had a dream in which he dedicated himself to God and to the poor. Those were the days when the Barbary pirates flourished, making descents on the old defendant countries, and kidnapping their inhabitants, whom they sold at Fez, Algiers, and Tunis. Two religious orders had made it their special task to collect arms for the ransom of the Catholics who were being sold in the slave market. It seems that Juan Suetad had the intention of consecrating himself to this sacred duty. He embarked for Ceuta, where he entered the service of an exiled and ruined Portuguese family, whom it was said he supported by his labour as an artisan. After a time he grew weary of this life, he left his master and sailed for Gibraltar where he established a small trade in relics and other sacred objects. The sale of these having brought him some money, he left Gibraltar and settled at Granada, where he opened a shop. He was then aged forty-three, and was just about to undergo that mental convulsion which determined his vocation. On the 20th of January, 1539, after hearing a sermon by Juan de Avila, he was seized by a fit of frantic devotion. He confessed his sins in a loud voice, rolled in the dust, pulled out the hair of his head, tore his clothes, and rushed through the streets of Granada, imploring the mercy of God, and followed by boys shouting after him as a madman. He entered his library, destroyed all the secular books in his possession, gave away the sacred ones, distributed his furniture and clothes to anyone who was willing to have them, and remained in his shirt, bidding his breast and calling on every one to pray for him. The crowd followed him noisily as far as the cathedral, where, half-naked, he again began his vociferations and bursts of despair. The preacher, Juan de Avila, having been informed of the conversion occasioned by his words, listened to the poor man's confession, consoled him, and gave him advice, which does not appear to have had much effect, since on leaving him, so he had rolled himself in a dung heap, proclaiming his sins in a loud voice. The crowd amused themselves by hissing him, throwing stones and mud, and otherwise maltreating him. Some, however, took pity on him and conducted him to the place set apart for the insane in the royal hospital, 
he was subjected to the treatment then in vogue that is he was bound and scourged in order to deliver him from the evil spirit supposed to possess him this attack of mania appears to have been one of great violence in general with regard to mental maladies the more excessive the alienation the more easily it ceases it is said that in the midst of the blows inflicted on him he took a vow to receive poor madmen and treat them as his fitting when the nervous exasperation was calmed he employed himself in attending on the sick and later on obtained his liberty and a certificate testing his sanity having made a vow to go on pilgrimage to the shrine of the virgin of guadeloupe he started barefoot without a farthing in the middle of winter on his way through the forests and across the moors he picked up dry sticks and made them into a faggot which then he reached an inhabitable place he gave in exchange for a little food and a night's lodging it is said that when he reached guadeloupe he had a vision which exercised a decisive influence on him the virgin appeared to him and gave him the child jesus naked with clothes to cover him this was to show him that he ought to have pity on the weak shelter the destitute and clothe the poor at least such was his interpretation his mission dates from that day and he executed it with so much more zeal as he believed it to have been laid upon him by the virgin whom he adored dressed in a white garment which an hieronymite monk had given him with a wallet on his back and a pilgrim's staff in his hand he returned to oropesa and went to lodge in the poorhouse the misery of the inmates so touched him that he went outside the city begged arms for them and gave them all that he received later on he took to selling faggots in the public square giving to the poor and sick all that he gained and slept in stables through the charity of their owners one day having seen a notice posted up in the square house to let for the poor he conceived the idea of making it into an asylum having begged money from the rich with which he bought mats blankets and utensils he received and sheltered forty-six sick and crippled paupers in order to maintain them he went about the streets at the dinner hour to collect from the rich the remnants of their meals crying do good my brethren it will return in blessing to yourselves john de dios's example provoked emulation several men offered themselves to help him he instructed them in their new duties and thus became the head of the group which by multiplying had become the great congregation now in existence the resources now put at his disposal permitted him to treat the sick as is fitting it is worthy of attention that john de dios was a reformer in the matter of treating the sick only placing one patient at each bed he was the first to divide the sick into classes he was in short the creator of the modern hospital and the founder of casual wards for he opened a connection with the hospital a house where the homeless poor and travellers without money could sleep it was at this period that he took the name juan de dios the good done by him did not remain unknown and the name of juan de dios father the poor was spread abroad through spain profiting by this he made a journey as far as granada and returned with abundant contributions he was exhausted by hardy work and exposure rather than by years he treated himself with exaggerated austerity always travelling on foot without shoes hat or linen only covered with a single grey garment he fasted with extreme frequency and imposed on himself the most trying exertions he would rush through a burning house to save the sick he often threw himself into the water to save children he may be said to have died of the hardships he endured during his last days he sent for antonio martin his earliest disciple and recommended the work to his care feeling the approach of death he left his bed to pray and died on his knees he was born on march eighth fourteen ninety five and died on saturday march eighth fifteen fifty he had a splendid funeral sick men touched the bier in the hope of being healed the sheet which covered the corpse was torn to pieces and each rag became a relic he was canonized september the twenty first sixteen thirty by urban the eighth and is now known as san juan de dios prosper and fantin prosper and fantin though an engineer a railway director and otherwise connected with such rational and prosaic subjects as mathematics nevertheless in eighteen fifty believed himself to be that in fact was the head of a new religion a variation of that of saint simon he had a handsome face and large forehead of an olympian cast he was very kind-hearted but profoundly convinced of his own infallibility on all subjects on industrial and philosophical questions on painting as well as on cooking he had what in a peculiar language of modern manners he called circumferential ideas in which every new fact found in its pre-established place the proper solution the new religion was to equalize men and women and to make the language of finance and industry poetical he himself represented the father 
and was always hoping to find the mother, the free woman, the Eve, a woman reasoning like a man, who knowing the needs and capabilities of women, would make the confession of her sex without restriction so as to furnish the elements for a declaration of the rights and duties of women. But the right woman was never found, for Madame de Stael and George Sand, to whom he and his friends first turned, laughed at them. They sought her in the east, at Constantinople, and found instead a prison. But, for all that, he never lost his illusion. He used to say that only great men could found a new religion. His goodness was exquisite. He constantly sacrificed himself for his followers, his sons as he called them. These wore at one time, like certain monomaniacs, a symbolical uniform, white trousers to represent love, red waistcoat for work, and blue coat for faith. This signified that his religion was founded on love, strengthened the heart with work, and was wholly encompassed by faith. Every one was to have his name written on his shirt front, and to wear in addition a collar adorned with triangles, and a semicircle, which was to become a circle as soon as a mother, Eve, aforesaid, had been found. These are the symbols usual with the monomaniac and the matoid. This is seen in their programs, in which they announce, in type of various sizes, that man recalls the past, women represents the future, the two united see the present. Yet in spite of all this, he foresaw, even tried to undertake the Suez Canal, and counted among his followers such men as Chevalier, Lambert, and Jordan. Lazaretti an example, the more curious as well as authentic, as it has manifested itself in recent years, under the eyes of all, and has arrived at the dignity of an historic event, is the case of David Lazaretti. This man was born at Archidoso in 1834. His father, a carter, appears to have been given to drink, but was a great strength. He had some relatives who were suicidal and others insane. One in particular died of a religious maniac and believed himself to be the eternal father. Lazaretti's six brothers were all strong men, of gigantic stature, ranging from 1.9 to 1.95 metres in height, which, however, is not uncommon in that part of the country, of quick wits and tenacious memory. David was distinguished from the rest by his superior stature, by the distinction and regularity of his features, by greater intelligence, by the large size of his head, which is dilacocephalic in form, and by his eyes, which some found fascinating, though to many, says the advocate Pugno, they seem to have the character of possession of, of insanity. It is asserted that he was hypnospatic and perhaps impotent in his youth, anomalies of no slight importance if we remember that moral, and especially Le Grand de Soul, have often discovered them in hereditary madmen. Even from his childhood, he showed these contradictions, those tendencies to extremes in character, which are frequent precursors of insanity. Thus, when a boy, he wished to become a monk. Later on, after he had taken to his father's trade, he began to lead an regular life, and gave himself up to alcoholic intemperance. In the meantime, however, he cultivated his mind by a course of reading, which was singular for a man in his position, including Dante and Tasso, and at fifteen he was called Thousand Ideas, from the strange songs he invented. Though he could never succeed in learning the rules of grammar, he was quarrelsome, he used a foulest language, and was treated by all, so much so that one day, on the occasion of a festival, unarmed and followed only by his brothers, he put to flight the entire population of Castel de Piano. Yet he was exactly excited by a speech, a poem, a sermon, a play, anything that appeared noble and great. He had an extreme veneration for Christ and Mahomet, whom he used to call the two greatest men that had ever appeared in the world. According to his own confessions, he had, at the age of fourteen, Various hallucinations of the same kind as those which proved so fatal to him in 1878. It is certain, besides that, at one time in his youth, he had a strong sympathy for a Jewess of Pizzicliano, awakened by the eloquence with which she defended her religion. Yet at that time, he was accustomed to say that there were three things he bored, women, churches, and dancing. In 1859, at 25, he enlisted as a volunteer in the cavalry, and in 1860 he took part in Cialdini's campaign, but rather as an officer's servant than as a soldier. Before starting, he wrote a patriotic hymn, which was sent to Proferio, and surprised him by the novelty of its thoughts and the beauty of some of the verses, contrasting strangely with the roughness of the phraseology and the numerous grammatical errors. After this, he again returned to his trade as a carter, at the same time to his habits of debauchery and foul language. He also rejoined his wife, 
whom he had married three years previously and for whom he felt a poetic affection which he carried so far as to write love songs to her here again his ambitious ideas reappeared and induced him anew though so uncultivated to seek fame through his verses and tragedies which read like burlesques gradually his fantastic delusions took another direction in eighteen sixty seven at thirty three he had whether as an effect of drink or of political excitement a return of the religious hallucinations of eighteen forty eight in more marked form than previously one day he disappeared in consequence of a vision of the madonna who had commanded him to go to rome and remind the pope who had first refused to receive him but afterwards treated him with courtesy though it is said not without advising him to try the remedy of a good shower bath of his divine mission he then went to the hermitage of montorio romano in the sabine mountains inhabited by a prussian monk named ignazio Micus. the latter kept him with him for three months in the quarter of the blessed amadeus directing him in his theological studies it is very probable though at this point we can only conjecture as all direct evidence is wanting that this monk assisted him to make the two marks on his forehead which he claimed to have received from the hand of st peter and which he hid under a lock of hair from the gaze of the profane showing them only to true believers this tattooing according to the testimony of medical men consists of an irregular parallelogram on the upper side of which are thirteen dots disposed in the form of a cross to this mark and to two others which he afterwards produced on himself on the deltoid muscle on the inside of the leg he attributed through a tendency common among the insane a strange and mysterious significance as seals of a special covenant with god the image of the tattoo is displayed on the page from that moment a complete change took place in him such as is often observed in the insane from being quarrelsome blasphemous and intemperate he became tractable gentle and abstemious to the point of living on bread and water in sabina and in the tempora on the mountains on herbs with salt and vinegar at other times he had no other food but polenta or soup maigre or bread with onions or garlic on the island of monte cristo in eighteen seventy he lived for over a month on six loaves garnished with a few herbs and in the french monastery he got through several days on two potatoes a day what must have appeared still more strange and surprised even cultured minds was the fact that the chaotic and burlesque writer became sometimes elegant always effective full of vigorous images supplied by a period comparable alone to that of the early christians this in fact struck the clergy of the district who hardly seeing him a repetition of the ancient prophets took him seriously all the more that according to their usual custom they perceived the means of making a profit out of him and getting a church rebuilt the people already justly astonished at his changed ways of life no less than by his tattooings his inspired speech his long neglected beard and grave bearing rushed in masses to hear him encouraged by the priests a procession was then organized in which lazaretti accompanied by priests and by some of the most influential among the lady marched to arcredoso rochel begna castel del piano pian castagniano sinegniano and santa fiora in all these places he was received with rejoicings by the people on their knees and the parish priests kissed his face and his hands and even his feet the construction of the church was begun and contributions to the building fund flowed in abundantly but though numerous the amounts were small the mountaineers been able to give much the notion was then suggested of employing the labour of their arms the side of the church being selected not far from acretoso about a hundred paces from the village at the spot called la crosse de kanzaki where by a strange fatality he was to receive his death shot the faithful assembled by thousands to begin the building men women and children were employed in carrying for scenes beams of wood and stones but unfortunately architecture like grammar has rules and in carrying them out prophetic inspiration is of little use without training thus as lazaretti's verses remained lame so the materials collected with so much labour remained a useless heap like the tower which was reached to heaven and never became more than a pile of stones in january eighteen seventy he founded the society of the holy league a mutual assistance society which he called the symbol of charity in march of the same year after having assembled his followers at a last supper he set out accompanied by raffaello and Giuseppe for the island of monte cristo where he remained for some months writing epistles prophecies and sermons he then returned to montelabro where he wrote down the visions 
or prophetic inspirations which he had and where he was arrested for sedition april twenty seventh after his liberation he found a society to which he gave the name of christian families this was considered very erroneously as a proof of continued fraud and he was arrested but discharged through the efforts of the advocate salvi after seven months imprisonment in eighteen seventy three lazaretti in obedience to other divine commands started on a journey passing through rome naples and turin where he proceeded to the Catrus at grenoble here he wrote the rules and disciple of the order of penitent hermits invented a system of cipher with a numerical alphabet and dictated the book of the heavenly flowers in which it is written that the great men shall descend from the mountains followed by a little band of mountain burghers to which are added the visions dreams and divine commands which he believed himself to have received in that place on his return to montalabro he found an immense crowd attracted both by devotion and curiosity encamped on the summit of the mountain to whom he addressed a sermon on the text god sees us judges us condemns us for this he was denounced to the authorities as tending to overthrow the government to promote civil war in the night of november nineteen eighteen seventy four he was arrested a second time and brought before the court of eighty this time the authorities were desirous of obtaining the opinion of non-specialist experts who with inexplicable want of perception pronounced him to be of sound mind and a cunning knave thus in spite of his strange publications and his tattoo marks he was condemned to fifteen months imprisonment and one year of police supervision for fraud and vagabondage the sentence however was referred to the court of appeal at perugia and on the second of august eighteen seventy five he was allowed to turn to montelebro where he reconstituted his society and placed the priest in Peruzzi at the head of it his health had suffered in prison and for this reason perhaps also to avoid new arrests and enjoy the glory of easy matrimony among the legitimist fanatics he went to france in october being mysteriously carried as he expressed it by the divine power into the environs of a town in burgundy he produced a book which with good reason he calls mysterious entitled my wrestling with god or the book of the seven seals with a description and nature of the seven eternal cities a mixture of genesis and revelation with sentences and rhapsodies entirely of an insane character he also wrote a manifesto addressed to all the princes in christendom in which he calls himself the great monarch and invites them to make alliance with him for at an unexpected time the end of the world shall be manifested to the latin nation in a way quite opposite to human pride in the same document he declares himself leader master judge and prince over all the potentates of earth these writings were copied for him by the priest in Peruzzi, who corrected the most conspicuous mistakes and many of them attained not only the undeserved honour of appearing in print but also that of being translated into french by the aid of m leon duvacht and various italian and foreign reactionaries who were taken lazaretti seriously however a short time after he was so far carried away by delirium as to begin inveighing against the corruptions of the priesthood and the practice of auricular confession for which he wished to substitute a public one thereupon the holy see declared his doctrines false and his writings subversive and the same man who had formerly written a work in favour of the pope now wrote and dispatched on may fourteen eighteen seventy eight an exhortation addressed to his brethren of the order of hermits against papal idolatry and the beast of the seven heads after all this with the usual contradictoriness of the insane he went to rome to lay aside his symbolic seal and his rod and retracted before the holy office he afterwards returned to montelebro he continued to deliver addresses against the catholic church which he said had become a shopkeeping church and against the priests true atheists in practice who not believing themselves profit by the belief of others preaching the holy reformation and declaring himself the man of mystery the new christ leader and avenger he exhorted believers to separate themselves from the world and prove their separation by abstaining from food and from sexual intercourse even in the case of married persons who however if they indulged were required to pray for at least two hours naked outside their bed before the act he issued paper money for considerable sums in proportion to the means at the disposal of the community i e up to one hundred and four thousand francs but it should be noted that this was absolutely useless being kept shut up in a closed vase this idea savours unmistakably of insanity after announcing a great miracle he caused to be prepared with a part of the money collected banners and garments for the members embroidered with the animals which had appeared to him in his hallucinations all of strange and grotesque shapes he had a rich one made for himself 
and for the rank and file a square piece of stuff to wear on the breast which showed a cross with two c's reversed the usual emblem of the association in august eighteen seventy eight he assembled a larger number than ever and having prescribed prayers and fasts for three days and three nights delivered addresses some of which were public others private and reserved for believers who were divided into the various classes of priest hermits penitentiary hermits penitent hermits and civil associations of the holy league and christian brotherhood and caused the so-called confession of the amendment to be made on the fourteenth fifteenth and sixteenth august on the seventeenth the great banner with the inscription the republic is the kingdom of god was raised on the tower then having assembled all the members at the foot of a cross erected for the purpose the prophet administered the solemn oath of fidelity and obedience at this point one of david's brothers tried to persuade him to renounce his perilous enterprise but in vain for on the contrary he replied that those who pointed out the possibility of a conflict he would on the following day show them a miracle to prove that he was sent from god in the form of christ a judge and a leader and therefore invulnerable and that every power on earth must yield to his will a sign from this rod of command was enough to annihilate all the forces of those who dared oppose him a member having remarked on the opposition of the government he added that he would ward off the balls with his hand and render harmless the weapons directed against himself and his faithful followers and the government carbineers themselves would act as a guard of honour to them more and more intoxicated with his delirium he wrote in all seriousness to the delegate of public safety to whom he had already shown the preparations and later on giving a half promise to countermand the procession that he was no longer able to do so having received superior orders to the contrary from god himself he threatened unbelievers with the divine wrath if through want of faith they rebelled against his will with such intentions on the morning of august eighteenth he set about from montalabro at the head of an immense crowd going down towards archidoso he was dressed in a royal cloak of purple embroidered with gold ornaments and crowned with a kind of tiara surmounted by a crest adorned with plumes and he held in his hand the staff of which he called his rod of command his principal associates were dressed less richly than himself in strangely fashioned robes of various colours according to their position in the hierarchy of the holy league the ordinary members were dressed in their everyday clothes without other mark of distinction than the emblematic breastplate previously described seven of the graduates of the brotherhood carried as many banners with the motto the republic is the kingdom of god they sang the davidian hymn each stanza of which ended up with the refrain eternal is the republic etc it is needless to relate what took place in those last hours the man who had shortly before called himself the king of kings and believed himself invulnerable fell struck by a shot fired by the orders perhaps by the hand of a delegate who had many a time been his guest it appears that he exclaimed as he fell under the influence of a last illusion the victory is ours it is certain that position he had arranged was not only unarmed but appeared to be in every way calculated to turn out perfectly harmless nakuto has well remarked that an exclamation of the strange emblematic properties of the league proved beyond all doubt that the government had mistaken a monomaniac for a rebel he took his stand on the passage of the nicene creed which states that christ rose from the dead and ascended to the right hand of the father whence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead having waited in vain for the appearance of christ he came to believe that this part must be reserved for him christ had twelve apostles therefore he wished to have twelve christ had included st peter among the number and lazaretti also determined to have st peter who was distinguished by the badge of a pair of cross keys on his breast in imitation of the forty days fast lazaretti fasted in midwinter in the island of monte cristo and there received communications from god amid the noise of the tempest the crash of thunders and the shaking the whole island there too he held a sort of last supper with his disciples on january fifteenth eighteen seventy in the course of which he said thus it has pleased him who directs me in all my works know that this supper carries with it the greatest of mysteries think that you are in place which god has chosen for his dwelling or to speak more correctly for his adoration here here not far from us on this soil shall be raised marvellous pyramids in honour of his most holy name and the said pyramids shall be an oracle of the divine majesty to say the truth he did not at this supper institute any sacrament but that nothing might be wanting in his mad idea of imitating jesus christ he evolved a sacrament of his own that of the confession of amendment at bottom a slight variation of auricular confession all this however was not sufficient david lazaretti was determined to have his transfiguration and his earthquake 
and promised them for august eighteen eighteen seventy eight when the surgeon was hesitating to operate on one of his sons for calculus he took the knife out of his hand and performed the operation the boy died under it but lazaretti quite undisturbed kept on repeating the son of david cannot die at the post-mortem examination a second tattoo mark was discovered on his body this was the usual cross placed inside a reverse tiara his brothers questioned on the subject replied that he had a golden seal made in france which he called the imperial seal and after that immersing it in boiling oil he had branded first his own flesh and then that of his sons and his wife with the impression which is in fact a convincing proof of the insensibility to pain peculiar to the insane and of their tendency to express their eccentric ideas by means of figures and symbols he claimed to leave a visible sign on the descent which in common with all his family he boasted from the emperor constantine however not satisfied to descend from a royal race he also wanted to rule the world in his own person though afterwards he was willing to content himself with the creation of a prince whom he would invest with it in a manifesto addressed to all christian princes he makes the following proclamation i address myself to all the princes of christendom catholics schismatics or heretics provided only they have been baptized it matters little whether or not they have been invested with power or the government of nations as so long as they are sprung from royal blood i call them all and the first one who shall present himself to me who is not under twenty years of age or over fifty and has no bodily imperfection i constitute him king in my stead the strange thing is that he was taken at his word by the comte de chambord who sent an embassy to him i have need he continued of a christian alliance i am decided to-day to hasten this great enterprise and if they the christian princes do not come to me within the fixed term of three years from the date of publication of this programme i will leave europe and go to the unbelieving nations to do with them who have not been able to do with christians but in that case woe to all of you princes of christendom ye shall be punished by the seven heads of the great antichrist which shall rise in the midst of europe and above all by youth who after my departure shall advance from the regions on the north towards central france and shall pretend to be that which i myself am from henceforward there appears in david lazaretti the fixed idea of being the king of kings and prince of princes to the head of the municipal body of architoso who would not obey him he said i am the king of kings the monarch of all monarchs i bear on my shoulders all the princes of the world all the carboneers and soldiers there are are mine and dependent on me and there are no ropes that can bind me to minusi who was trying to escape unnoticed he said you don't know that i am the prince of princes the king of all the earth and if you try to run away i will have you stoned alive the witness g b rosie was present at the sermon on the seventeenth and heard david say that he was the king of kings christ the judge that the pope was no longer to reside at rome but that he lazaretti on certain conditions would provide him with another residence and that the king of italy too would be his subject the witness mariotti also deposed that he had heard david say in his sermon that he had no fear of force that even with a million of soldiers it was impossible for a subject to arrest his monarch lastly not to lengthen the series of proofs the witness giuseppe tonini heard him assert in the sermon that he was the king of kings and commanded the whole world while the witness valentino mazzetti says that lazaretti was determined to hold the position of august eighteenth at any cost and that do you think they are going to arrest us no no it is not possible for subjects to arrest their monarch the emblematic device he adopted is worth noting the double c to which he attached so much importance representing the first and second christ i e christ the son of st joseph of nazareth and christ the son of the late joseph lazaretti of archidoso in truth it is not in any way comprehensible what relation christ could hold to constantine the latter to david and all these to lazaretti but the relation exists precisely in those strange contradictions and absurdities which amid the persistence of the prince's idea constantly come to the surface in monomaniacs so that some have wished to class their disease as dementia in fact although they keep up the character so to speak far better than general paralytics and try to give a plausible appearance to their delirium yet oftentimes when overpowered with the necessity of finding a vent for their persistent ambitious idea they pay no attention to the contradictions they fall into a pavia embroideress believing herself a descendant of the bonaparte family 
modelled her dress language and aspect with great success to those of the members of the reigning families yet while she asserted herself to be the daughter of mary louise she at the same time claimed victor emmanuel as her father as on other occasions she tried to persuade us that she had found the poison of vipers in the eggs she was eating thus though at first calling on the pope to liberate italy lazaretti when excommunicated or merely treated with contempt by the pope wrote against papa idolatry though he wished to die a member of the catholic apostolic church he inveighed against auricular confession which is a very pivot of catholicism and while he called himself the son of david he also wished to be thought the son of constantine Passanante. Passanante, the would-be regicide of naples has no morbid hereditary antecedents at the age of twenty-nine his height was one point six three metres and his weight fifty one and a half kilograms i.e. fourteen kilograms less than the nobility in average his head may be described as almost submicrocephalic cephalic index eighty two probable capacity one thousand five hundred thirteen his features show the characteristics of the mongol and the cretan small and deeply set eyes abnormally far apart zygomatic bones highly developed beard scanty the pupils show a low degree of morbidity and the genitals are atrophied a fact connected with that of almost complete anaphrodisia on the other hand the liver and spleen are hypertrophied which partly explains the increase of the temperature varying from thirty eight degrees to thirty seven point eight degrees at the armpits the weakness of the pulse eighty eight and the very slight degree of strength which moreover is less on the right side sixty kilos than on the left seventy eight kilos this last fact which perhaps arises from an old burn on the hand is most important because rendering the complete carrying out of the crime improbable especially taking into account the clumsy weapon with which he was armed and the unfavourable position which was the only one he could take the sensibility was perverted the tactile presenting five millimetres on the back of the hand where the normal sensitiveness is from sixteen to twenty and seven on the forehead where it is usually from twenty to twenty two that on the palm of the hand was not registered on the contrary the sensitiveness of the skin to puncture was much weakened in prison he had attacks of delirium accompanied by hallucinations all these characteristics are clear indications of disease both in the abdominal viscera and in the nervous centres this result is even more evident from the psychological study of the case a merely superficial examination might have induced the belief that his affections and moral sentiments were normal he showed indeed a horror of crime lived a most frugal and abstemious life while sometimes so religious sometimes exaggerated patriotic always appeared to prefer the advantage of others to his own he thus presented to those unversed in the study of mental pathology the appearance as it were of a matter to an idea which had been maturing for years the mouthpiece and tool of a power sect who might call for execration politically but as an individual command respect this view however is at once seen to be fallacious even leaving aside the delirium which might have been the effect of imprisonment if we remember that as has already been said frugality and unselfishness are special characteristics of the metoid and not seldom also of the insane some of whom seem to have more affection for their country and for humanity in general than for their families and themselves and if we notice the indifference or even pleasure which would in his writings he refers to the murders committed by his countrymen when to the sound of axes they make foreigners give them money above all the enjoyment with which he records the cruel practical joke played on a poor man who was very fond of his cherry tree by digging up the ladder bringing it about stripped of its fruit and leaving it at his front door this morbid apathy is especially revealed in the want of emotion shown after the crime in the fact of the anger of the populace which were let loose against him yet even the greatest fanatics among political assassins such as orsini sand and obilling have been overwhelmed by the emotion after the deed and have often attempted suicide the true motive of the act is quite sufficient to prove this being dismissed from his situation on account of his political vagaries arrested as a vagabond an addition ill-used by the police he thought with a vanity as boundless as his impertinence to gratify it or even to live of imitating the heroes he had heard talked of in the clubs and against whom he had himself declaimed so as to find a way of ending his life by the hand of another as i find myself ill used by my employers and felt a horror of life i formed the design of assassinating the king so as not to have to kill myself he said to the magistrate immediately after his arrest 
to the judge as editor, I attempted the king's life in the certainty that I should be killed. In fact, two days previously, he had been much more occupied with the dismissal from his place than with projects of regicide, and at his arrest, he did all he could to make his situation more serious, reminding the delegate that he had forgotten his revolutionary card on which was written, Death to the King, Long Live the Republic. It was a case of indirect suicide, such as Maudsley, Crichton, Esquirol, and Kraft Ebbing have recorded in great numbers. These, however, are only committed by the insane, or by cowardly and immoral men. I insist upon this motive all the more that he formed at the same time the means of satisfying that incoherent vanity which in him predominated over the love of life. It is well known that many vain suicidal maniacs enjoy the sight of their own death surrounded by pomp, like the Englishman who had a mass composed, executed in public, and shot himself while the Regiscat was being chanted. If therefore we find in him any fanaticism, it is not for politics, but for his own ridiculous and ungrammatical effusions. When he lost his temper and shed tears at the trial, the outburst was not provoked by any insult to his party, but by a refusal to permit the reading of one of his letters and when his reputation as a scullion was attacked by the assertion that he was continually reading instead of washing up the dishes which he flatly denied though he implied proof of unsoundness of mind would have been entirely in his favour his intelligence might be called unusual and original rather than superior to the average and appeared much more brilliant in his conversations than in his writings in which it is difficult to find a vigorous expression such as we so frequently meet within the works of the insane as distinguished from matoids However, searching here and there amid the enormous mass of his writings, and piecing out the gaps, we meet with some few fragments which are both original and curious. For example, though grotesque enough, his idea of having deputies and officials chosen by lot, like soldiers for the conscription, that they may not be so proud, is not without originality. Equally striking is the idea of forcing the convicts, who pass their time in enforced idleness, to cultivate waste lands of calling out the young men for conscription before they have chosen a trade and of crying after the emperor william who wants five milliards from france he who sows thorns should be made to walk barefoot good too in its way though somewhat turkish is that of establishing a free inn for travellers in every village still more remarkable is this which if it had not been written some time previously might be taken as referring to his own case it is above all that the authorities should exercise severity of punishment towards a man whose only idea is to change the form of government and attack the head of the state the country is a mother of all without distinction to all without distinction law should be sister of death which has no respect for any but cuts them down when their time has come his contrast between man isolated and man in association with his fellows is worthy of gusti when you see him alone he is weak as a glass tumbler you see a glass think of the strength of man there is no great difference but united men become hard and have the strength of a thousand samsons where he really appeared superior to the average was in his viva vos answers thus history studied practically among the people is more instructive than the history studied in books the people is the best teacher of history etc to justify the literary pretensions which seem so inconsistent with his position as a poor cook he replied where the learned man goes astray, the ignorant often triumphs. When asked what takes place at the conscious when one is about to commit a bad action, he replied, In us there are, as it were, two wills, one pushing us on, the other holding us back, and the one that proves strongest determines the action. But it is precisely in his interment flesh as a political insight, so strange in his position, that a morbid abnormality becomes evident, for it must be remarkable that they constitute rather the exception than the rule. All we find, as a rule, is a commonplace and the absurd. In the same code, he proposes to hang coiners and burn thieves and abolish the death penalty. He wishes to kill the king. In another article, he demands for him a pension of two and a half millions. Guitau. The same thing may be said of Guitau, who presented an enormous number of degenerative characteristics. His handwriting is quite that of the matoid, and he was descended from a family which counted among its members many lunatics and fanatics advocate theologian politician and swindler he had tried all trades and claimed to have made a great discovery about the birth of christ the fact is that he had spoiled a great deal of paper and issued one or more journals and ridiculous works of the existence of hell and on truth which he believed to be written under divine dictation 
he thought that god would pay his debts as a reward for his eccentric preachings it was in obedience to a divine command that he killed garfield it was only done in revenge for his failure to appoint him u s consul at liverpool ambassador to austria etc which showed great ingratitude on garfield's part considering the trouble Goethe had taken in his own belief to secure his election as president south americans the number of great men in the argentine republic suffered from cerebral affections is so considerable that it has enabled Mejia to compose on this subject a work which is among the most curious and valuable produced in the new world thus according to Mejia, rivadura was a hypochondriac and died of softening of the brain manuel garcia also suffered from hypochondria and finally succumbed to a brain affection admiral brown was subject to the delusion that he was persecuted valera was epileptic francia was a melancholiac rosas was morally insane and montegudo was hysterical end of chapter four part three and end of section fifteen section sixteen of the man of genius by caesar lombroso this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recorded by leon harvey part four synthesis the generous psychosis of genius chapter one characteristics of insane men of genius characterlessness vanity precocity alcoholism faker bondage versatility originality style religious doubts sexual abnormalities egoism eccentricity inspiration the concept of the morbid and degenerative character of genius is confirmed and completed more and more when its isolated phenomena are subjected to a more rigorous examination and as in chemical reactions to mutual contact even in fact we analyze the lives and works of those great diseased minds which have become famous in history we find that they can at once be distinguished by many characteristic traits from the average man and also in part from other geniuses who have completed their life's orbit without trace of madness one these insane geniuses have scarcely any character the full complete character which bends not for any winds that blow is a distinctive mark of honest and sound-minded men tasso on the contrary declaims against courts and yet even to his last hour we find him perpetually coming back to beg their grudging favours cardan accuses himself of lying evil speaking and gambling Russell, though so sensitive abandons to want the tenderest and kindest of friends casts off his children calumniates others and himself and apostatizes three times over from catholicism from protestantism and what is worse from the religion of philosophy swift through an ecclesiastic wrote the obscene poem of the loves of strephon and clo and belittled the church of which he was a dignitary though his pride reached the proportions of delirium Lenau, religious to fanaticism in savonarola shows himself in the albigensis even cynically sceptical he knows it confesses it and laughs at it schopenhauer denounced women and at the same time was too warm an admirer of the sex he professed to believe in the happiness of nirvana and then predicted for himself more than a hundred years of life two genius is conscious of itself appreciates itself and certainly has no monkish humility yet the conceit seething in diseased brains passes the limits of all truth and probability tessa and cardan covertly and mahabitomedly declare themselves inspired by god and the slightest criticism therefore appeared to them as deadly persecution cardan wrote of himself my nature is placed on the very limits of human substance and conditions and within the confines of the immortals or so i believe that all men and sometimes even the elements were in a conspiracy against him perhaps it is on this very account that we have seen almost all these unhappy great spirits fly from association with other men swift humiliated and insulted cabinet ministers and read to a duchess desirous of making his acquaintance that the greater men were the lower must they bow before him Lenau had inherited the pride of rank from his mother and his delirium believed himself king of hungary three some of these unfortunate men have given strangely precocious proofs of their genius tasso could speak when six months old and knew latin at the age of seven 
Linnell, at a very early age, composed most touching sermons and played the bagpipes and the violin with astonishing skill. Cardin at eight had apparitions and revelations of genius, and Pierre was a mathematician at thirteen. Pascal, at ten, inspired by the noise made by a plate struck with a knife, worked out a theory of sound, and at fifteen composed his celebrated treatise on conic sections. Hayler preached at four and devoured books at five. 4. Many of them have been excessive in their abuse of narcotics, or of stimulants and intoxicants. Hayler was in the habit of taking enormous doses of opium, and Rousseau was excessive in his use of coffee. Tasso was renowned as a drinker, and also the modern poets Cleist, Gerard de Naval, Musset, Merger, Majlath, Praga, and Rovani, as well as a very original Chinese writer, Li Te Bo, who was inspired by alcohol and died of it. Lenau, also in his later years, was an immoderate consumer of wine, coffee, and tobacco. Baudelaire abused opium, tobacco, and wine. Cardin confessed himself an indefatigable drinker. Poe was a dipsomaniac. So was Hoffman. 5. Nearly all of these great men, moreover, showed anomalies of the reproductive functions. Tosso, who was guilty of exaggerated licentiousness in his youth, was rigidly chased after his thirty-eighth year. On the other hand, Cardin, impotent in his youth, gave himself up to excess at thirty-five. Pascal, sensual in his early youth, afterwards believed even a mother's kiss to be a crime. Rousseau was affected by hypospadias and spermatoria, and like Baudelaire, was subject to a sexual perversion. Newton and Charles XII, so far as is known, were absolutely continent. Linnell wrote, I have the painful conviction that I am unsuitable for marriage. 6. Instead of preferring the quiet seclusion of the study, they cannot rest in any place, and have to be continually travelling. Lenau removed from Vienna to Stockerau, and then to Krumden, and finally emigrated to America. I need, he said, a change of climate every now and then disturbed my blood. Tasso was continually travelling from Ferrara to Urbano, Mantua, Naples, Paris, Bergamo, Rome, and Turin. Beau was the despair of his editors, because he was continuously wandering between Boston, New York, Richmond, Philadelphia, and Baltimore. Giordano Bruno wandered to Padua, Oxford, Wittenberg, Magdeburg, Helmstadt, Prague, and Geneva. Rousseau, Card, and Cellini were constantly staying now at Turin, now at Paris, now at Florence, Rome, Bologna, or Lausanne. Change of place, says Rousseau, is a necessity for me. In a fine season, I find it impossible to remain for more than two or three days in one place without suffering. 7. Sometimes they changed their career and course of study several times in succession, as though the mighty intellect could not find rest and relief in a single science. Swift, in addition to his satiric poems, wrote on the manufacturers of Ireland, on theology, on politics, and on the history of the reign of Queen Anne. Cardin was at the same time a mathematician, physician, theologian, and literary man. Rousseau was painter, music master, charlatan, philosopher, botanist, and poet, and Hoffman, magistrate, caricaturist, musician, romance writer, and dramatist. Tasso, as it goggle after him, attempted all variety of poetry, epic, dramatic, and didactic, in all meters. Newton and Pascal, in moments of aberration, abandoned physics for theology. Linnell cultivated medicine, agriculture, law, poetry, and theology. 8. These energetic and terrible intellects are the true pioneers of science. They rush forward regardless of danger, facing with eagerness the greatest difficulties. Perhaps because it is these which best satisfy their morbid energy, they seize the strangest connections, the newest and most salient points. And here I may mention that originality, carried to the point of absurdity, is a principal characteristic of insane poets and artists. Ampere always sought out the most difficult problems in mathematics, the abysses, as Arago has noted. Rousseau, in the Devon du Village, had attempted the music of the future, afterwards tried again by another insane genius, Schumann. Swift used to say that he only felt at ease when treating the most difficult subjects, and those most out of the line of his habitual occupations. In fact, in his directions to servants, he seems, not a theologian nor a politician, but a servant himself. His confession of a thief was believed to have been really written by a well-known criminal, so the latter's accomplices, thinking that they were discovered, gave themselves up to justice. In the prophecies of Biggerstaff, he assumed the character of a Catholic, and succeeded in deceiving the Roman Inquisition. Walt Whitman is a creator of a rhymeless poetry. 
which the anglo-saxons regard as a poetry of the future and which certainly bears the imprint of strange and wild originality poe's compositions says baudelaire one of his greatest admirers seem to have been produced in order to show that strangeness may enter into the elements of the beautiful and he collected them under the title of arabesques and grotesques because these exclude the human countenance and his literature was extra human here too we note the predilection of insane artists for arabesques and moreover for arabesques which suggest the human figure baudelaire himself created the prose poem and carried to the highest point of adoration of artificial beauty he was the first to find new poetic associations in the olfactory sense. 9. These morbid geniuses have a style peculiar to themselves, passionate, palpitating, vividly coloured, which distinguishes them from all other writers, perhaps because it could only arise under maniacal influences, so much so that all of them confess their inability to compose or even to think outside the moments of inspiration. Tasso wrote in one of his letters, I am unsuccessful and find difficulty in everything, especially in composition. My ideas, Rousseau confesses, are confused, so in arising, and developing themselves. Nor can I express myself well except in moments of passion. The eloquent and vivid extordiums of Cardan's works, so different from the rest of his tedious books, shows what a difference there was between the first and last moments of his inspiration. Haller, though a successful poet himself, used to say that the whole art of poetry consisted in its difficulty. Pascal began his 18th provincial letter 13 times. Perhaps it was this analogy in character and style which was the cause of Swift's and Rousseau's predilection for Tasso, and drew the severe halo towards Swift, while Ampere was inspired by Rousseau's eccentricities and Baudelaire by those of Poe, whose works he translated, and of Hoffmann, who he idolised. 10. Nearly all these great men were painfully preoccupied by religious doubts, raised by the intellect and combated as a crime by the timid conscious and morbid emotions tasso was tormented by the fear of being a heretic and beer often said that doubts are the worst torture of man haller wrote in his journal my god give me oh give me one drop of faith my mind believes in thee but my heart refuses this is my crime lenau used to repeat towards the end of his life in those hours when my heart is suffering the idea of god passes away from me in fact the real hero of his savanarola is doubt as is now admitted by all critics eleven all insane men of genius moreover are much preoccupied with their own ego they sometimes know and proclaim their own disease and seem as though they wished by confessing it to get relief from his inexorable attacks it is quite normal that being men of great intellect and therefore acute observers they should at last notice their own cruel anomalies and be struck by the spectacle of the ego which obtruded itself so painfully on their notice men in general but more particularly the insane love to speak of themselves and on this theme they even become eloquent and the more shall be expected in those whose genius is accompanied and quickened by mania it is thus we get those wonderful records of passion and grief monuments of phrenopathic poetry which reveal the great unhappy personality of the writer cardan wrote not only his autobiography but also poems on his misfortunes and the work Dissomnis, equally composed of his dreams and hallucinations. The poets of Whitman are the glorification of the ego. Rousseau, by his confessions, dialogues, reveries, like de Musset in his confessions, and Hoffman in Chrysler, only give a minute description of themselves in their own madness. Thus also Poe, as Baudelaire has well remarked, took his text, The Exceptions of Human Life, the hallucination which, at first doubtful, afterwards became a reasoned conviction, absurdity enthroned in the region of intellect and governing it with a terrible logic hysteria occupying the place of the will the contradiction between the nerves and the mind carried so far that grief is driven to utter itself in laughter pascal who is driven by delirium into exaggerated humility who has said that christianity suppressed the ego has not written his autobiography yet he who shows traces of his hallucinations in the celebrated amulet and in his pensees subtly described himself when speaking of others it is certain that he was alluding to himself when he wrote that extreme genius is close to extreme folly and that men are so mad that he who should not be so would be a madman of a new kind and when he observed that maladies influence our judgment and sense and while great ones perceptibly alter them even slight ones cannot but influence them in proportion and that men of genius have their heads higher but their feet lower than the rest of us 
they are all on the same level and stand in the same clay as ourselves children and brutes Haller, in his diary, gives detailed notes of his own religious delusions and often confesses to having completely changed his character in the course of twenty-four hours and being giddy, mad, persecuted by God and scorned and despised by men. Lesman, who, at a later time, hanged himself, wrote the humorous diary of a melancholiac, 1834. Tasso, in his letter to the Duke of Urbino and in the stanza already quoted, clearly depicted his own insanity. Francesco, he says elsewhere, O oh, Francesco, within my infirm limbs I have an infirm soul. It is a curious fact that shortly before his first attack of mania he wrote these words, As I do not deny that I am mad, I must believe that my madness has been caused by drunkenness or love, since I know well that I drink to excess, etc. Dostoevsky continually introduces semi-insane characters, and especially epileptics, in Bessai and the Idiot, the moral lunatics of crime and punishment. Gerard de Nerval was the author of Aurelia, which has been well called the Song of Songs of Fever, and is a mixture of poetry and gibberish. Barbara wrote Les Détruques. Buston described his own hallucinations. Alex, though not a medical man, wrote on the treatment of the insane. Though now, twelve years before he actually succumbed to the attacks of insanity, had foreseen described it. All his poems depict, in colours painfully vivid, suicidal melancholic tendencies. Reader may judge of this from the mere titles of some of his lyrics. To a hypochondriac. The madman. The diseased soul. The violence of a dream. The moon of melancholy. I do not think that it is possible to find, in the most doleful pages of J. Orto's so accurately and vividly coloured, a description of suicidal tendencies as, in the former extract from Seal and Crank, I carry a deep wound in my heart. I will carry it in silence to the grave. My life is broken from hour to hour. One alone could comfort me, but she lies in the grave. O oh, my mother, let myself be moved by my entreaties. If thy love still survive death, it is still permitted thee to care for thy child. O oh, let me soon escape from life. I long for the night of death. O, oh, only help the crazy son to lay aside his grief. His tram then is, as I observed, a terrible truthful picture of that hallucination which preceded or accompanied the first attack of suicidal mania, and here the reader can easily trace in the phrases and ideas that disconnected the fragmentary character which is the mark of the delirious paralytic. Here is a specimen. The dream was so terrible, so wild, so frightful, that I wish I could tell myself it was nothing but a dream, yet I continue to weep and to feel that my heart beats. I awaken and find the sheets and pillow wet. Did I seize them in my dream and wipe my face? I do not know. While I was sleeping, my hostile guests have been holding an orgy there. Now they are gone. Those savages, they are gone. But I find their traces in my tears. They have fled and left the wine on the table, etc. He had previously, in the Albigenses, dropped some allusions to the terrible impression made on him by his dreams. Terrible, often in the bite of dreams, it shakes, pains, presses, threatens, and in the sleeper does not awaken in time, if the twinkle of an eye, he is a corpse. 12. The principal trace of the delusions of great minds is found in the very construction of their works and speeches, in their illogical deductions, absurd contradictions, and grotesque and human fantasies. Thus Socrates was clearly of unsound mind, when, after having all but arrived, intuitively, at Christian morality and Judaic monotheism, he directed his steps in accordance with the sneeze, or the voice and signs of his imaginary genius. Thus Cardan, who had anticipated Newton in discovering the laws of gravitation and dubious in theology, who in his book De Subtilitate explains as hallucinations the strange and portentous symptoms of the possessed, and also of some of those hermits who are accounted saints, carrying them with the delirium of quiet and fever. Cardan was insane when he attributed to the influence of a genius not only his scientific inspirations, but the creaking of the table and the vibration of the pen, when he declared that he had been several times bewitched, and when he produced his book on dreams, which speaks to the mental pathologist as a suede membrane or to the physical. In this, at first, he puts on record the most accurate and curious observations of the phenomena of dreams, e.g. how severe physical pains act with less energy, slight ones are greater, a fact recently confirmed by psychiatrists that the insane are much given to dreaming that in a dream as on the stage a long series of ideas passes in a very short space of time and finally and this is a remark of much justice 
the men have dreams either entirely analogous to or entirely at variance with their own habits but of these clear and undoubted proofs of genius he reaffirms one of the most absurd and contemptible theories ever held by the paupers of ancient times namely that the slightest accidental circumstance of a dream must be the revelation of a more or less distant future thus he draws up with the sincerest conviction a dictionary identical in form and origin which lasts undoubtedly pathological with cabalistic productions every object every word which may find a place at a dream is there attached to a series of illusions which serve to interpret each other father may signify author husband son commander feet foundation of a house arts workmen etc a horse appearing in a dream may signify flight riches or a wife shoemaker and physician are interchangeable in meaning in short it is not actual analogies which prevail but analogies in words in sounds even in terminations orior and morior have an equal prophetic value because since they differ from each other only by a single letter the one passes over to the other we are seized with a compassion for human nature and for ourselves and we find him relating that a knight who suffered from the stone always if he dreamed of food had an attack on the following day and adding quibus enim et dolores de gustare dicimas as no nature were in the habit of amusing herself by making puns in latin yet this was a man who had intuitively divided the admirable theory of painful sensations in sleep already alluded to and who a physician and one of no mean distinction had clearly conceived the sympathetic action of the solar plexus newton himself can scarcely be said to have been sane when he demanded his intellect to the interpretation of the apocalypse or the horns of daniel nor again when he wrote to bentley by means of the law of attraction one can very well understand the elongated orbits of comets but as to the nearly circular orbits of planets i see no possibility of obtaining their lateral difference this can only be accomplished by god yet in his optics newton had inveighed against those who after the manner of the aristotelians admit occult properties in matter thus arresting the researches of natural philosophers without leading to any conclusion in fact a century later the true cause which had escaped newton's observations was discovered by laplace ampere believed in all sincerity that he had found the method of squaring a circle Pascal, though he had been the first to study the laws of probability believed that the touch of a relic had power to cure a lacrimal fistula a statement which he printed in one of his works rousseau makes of his own maniacal savagery the ideal type of man and believes that every natural production if agreeable to the sight or taste must be nauseous so that arsenic according to him could not be harmful his life is made up of contradictions he prefers the country and lives in the rue platinere he writes a treatise on education and sends his children to the foundling hospital he educates on the claims of the various religions with the acuteness of an unbiased sceptic and throws stones at trees in order to divine the future and decide the question of his own salvation nay he writes to the deity and lays his letters on the altars of churches as though they were his exclusive abode baudelaire finds the sublime in the artificial like the rogue which enhances the beauty of a handsome woman he carries out an insane idea by describing a metallic landscape with neither water nor vegetation all is rigid polished shining without heat and without sun in the midst of the internal silence the blue water is enclosed like the ancient mirrors in a golden basin he finds his ideal in the latin of the decadence the only tongue which can thoroughly render the language of passion and adores cats to such a degree as to address three poems to them lenau in his moon of the hypochondriac sees contrary to the usual practice of poets in the cold moon without water and without atmosphere the sextant of the planets who with a silver thread entwined enchains the sleepers and draws them to death she beckons with her finger leads sleepwalkers astray and counsels the thief there was a young man he had frequently expressed his opinion that mysticism is a symptom of insanity he often showed mystical tendencies especially in his later poems in the koran there is not a single chapter which has any connection with another on the contrary it often happens that in the course of a single surah the ideas are interrupted and follow each other almost at random o mohammed writes morkos the most contradictory vertex may be pronounced for it is impossible to deny his great excellence while at the same time there is no disguising the fact that we find in him the most signal artifices of imposture the grossest ignorance and the greatest imprudence it appears to me moreover that the great writers who have been under the dominion of alcohol have a style peculiar to themselves whose characteristics are deliberate eroticism and an inequality which is rather grotesque than beautiful 
owing to the unrestrained fancy frequent imprecations and abrupt transitions from the deepest melancholy to obscene gaiety and a marked preference for such subjects as madness drink and the gloomiest scenes of death poe says baudelaire likes to place his figures against greenish or violet backgrounds surrounded by the phosphorescence of decay and the atmosphere of storms and orgies he throws himself into grotesquerie for the love of the grotesque into horror for the love of the horrible the same thing is done by baudelaire himself who loves to describe the effects of alcohol or opium there are days when my heart faints in me and the mud overwhelms me sang poor praga who killed himself with alcohol and who singing the praises of wine blasphemed thus let it come the reproach of the sober man come the contempt of the human race come the hell of the eternal father i will go down into it with my glass in hand steen the drunken painter usually painted drinking scenes hoffman's drawings ended in caricatures his tales in extra human extravagancies his music in a senseless succession of sounds alfred de musset saw in the lays of madrid sus un col di signe un sin verge et dore coma la jua vigne Murger admired women with green lips and yellow cheeks no doubt through a species of colour blindness such as we have already met with among painters thirteen nearly all of these great men for instance cardan lanau tasso socrates pascal attached great importance to their dreams which no doubt assumed a more vivid and powerful colouring than those of sane persons fourteen many presented volminous but very irregular skulls and like madmen have ended by serious alterations of the nervous centres pascal's cerebral substance was harder than is normally the case and the left lobe had separated the brain of Rassau revealed dropsy in the ventricles byron and foscolo great by centric geniuses both showed premature ossification of the sutures schumann died of chronic meningitis and cerebral atrophy fifteen the insane characters of men of genius are scarcely ever found alone thus melancholia was associated and alternated with exaggerated self-esteem in chopin comte tasso cardin schopenhauer with alcoholic mania impulsive insanity or sexual aversion in baudelaire and Russell, with erratic and alcoholic mania and that of self-esteem in gerard de nerval in coleridge the mania of morphia was associated with folie du doubt sixteen but the most special characteristic of this form of insanity appears to reduce itself to an extreme exaggeration of two alternating phases viz erethism and atony inspiration and exhaustion which we see physiologically manifested in nearly all great intellects even the sanest phrases to which they or the like give a wrong interpretation according as their pride is gratified or offended an indolent soul afraid of every kind of business a bilious temperament which suffers easily and is sensitive to every discomfort seem as though they could not be combined in one character yet they form the groundwork of mine such as Rousseau's confession in letter two therefore as the ignorant man explains the modifications of his own ego by means of material and external objects they often attribute to a devil a genius or a god the happy inspiration of the exalted moments tasso speaking of his familiar spirit genius or messenger says it cannot be a devil since it does not inspire me with a horror for sacred things nor yet a natural creature for it causes to arise in me ideas which i never had before a genius inspires cardan with his written works his knowledge of spiritual matters his medical opinions tartini with his sonata mahomet with the pages of the koran van helmont asserted that he had seen a genius appear before him at all the most important moments of his life and in sixteen thirty three he discovered his own soul under the form of a shining crystal william blake often retired to the seashore to converse with moses homer virgil and milton with whom he believed himself to have been previously acquainted when questioned as to their appearance he replied there are shades full of majesty grey but luminous and much taller than the generality of men socrates was counselled in his actions by a genius who as he expressed it was better than ten thousand teachers and he often advised his friends as to what they ought or ought not to do according as he had received instructions of his daimonion it is certain that the vivid and richly coloured style of all these great men the clearness with which they describe their most grotesque eccentricities such as the lilliputian academies or the horrors of tartarus to note that they saw and touched as it were with a certainty of hallucination all that they describe that in short in them inspiration and insanity became fused and resulted in a single product it may be said indeed 
of some, as of Luther, Mohammed, Savonarola, Millions, and modern times the chief of the taping rebels, that the false explanation of the afflites was of great service to them, giving to their speeches and prophecies that air of truth, and resulting in a profound conviction, which alone can shake the popular ignorance and carry it in the wake of a new doctrine. This characteristic is common to the insanity of genius and the most trivial aberrations of eccentricity. When inspiration and high spirits fail together, and depression of mind prevails, then these great unfortunate ones, interpreting their own conditions still more strangely, believe themselves to have been poisoned, like Cardam, or to be condemned to internal fire, like Haller and Pierre, or persecuted by inveterate enemies, like Newton, Swift, Barthes, Cardin, and Russell. Moreover, in all these cases, with this doubt, raised by the intellect, in despite of the hurt, appears to the subject himself as a crime, and becomes both cause and instrument of new and real misfortunes. 18. Yet the temper of these men is so different from that of the average people that it gives a special character to the different psychosis, melancholia, monomania, etc., from which they suffer, so as to constitute a special psychosis, which might be called the psychosis of genius. End of section 16. Section 17 of The Man of Genius by Caesar Lombroso. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 2. Analogy of Sane to Insane Genius. Want of Character. Pride. Precocity. Alcoholism. Degenerative Signs. Obsession. Men of Genius and Revolutions. But these characteristics are not confined to insane genius. There are some men with, though far less conspicuously, among the great men freest from any suspicion of insanity, those of whom the insane geniuses just mentioned are but the exaggeration and caricature. It is thus set the complete and perfect character, while conspicuously seen in Socrates, Columbus, Gavour, Christ, Galileo, Spinoza, is not to be found in Napoleon, Bacon, Cicero, Seneca, Alcibiades, Alexander, Julius Caesar, Machiavelli, Carlyle, Frederick the Second, Dumas, Byron, Comte, Balwer Lytton, Petrarch, Aretino, Gibbon. Self-esteem, carried to an almost incredible point, has been noticed in Napoleon, Hegel, Dante, Victor Hugo, La Salle, Balzac, and Comte. And as we have already seen, even in men of talent, but not of genius, as Cagnoli, Lucius, Porter, etc. Precocity, moreover, does not fail to appear in normal men of genius, such as Mozart, Raphael, Michelangelo, Charles XII, Stuart Mill, D'Alembert, Lully, Cowley, Otway, Prior, Pope, Addison, Burns, Keats, Sheffield, Hugo. Among these we also find the abuse of alcohol, sexual deficiencies, or excesses followed by sterility, the tendency to vagrancy, and impulsive acts of violence, alternating or associated with convulsive movements. Bismarck once said to Beust, Do you ever feel the wish to break anything as an amusement? Like Gladstone and the Belgian Malin, he often takes exercise by cutting down trees like a woodman. We have also found in some of them numerous anomalies in the shape of the skull and conformation of the brain. Degenerative symptoms such as stammering, left-handedness, precocity, sterility, abound above, as well as divergences from ancestral character. There is also seen in them that invasion, or rather possession, by their subject which transforms the creature of the imagination into the true hallucination, or an auto-suggestion. Flaubert says that his character seized upon him and pursued him, or that, more correctly speaking, he lived through them. When he described the poisoning of Madame Bovary, he felt the taste of arsenic on his tongue, and showed symptoms of actual poisoning so far as to vomit. Dickens, too, was affected by sorrow and compassion for his characters, as if they had been his own children. To my mind, writes Edmond de Concourt, my brother died of overwork, and more especially the elaboration of literary form, the chiselling of phrases, the labour of style. I can still see him taking up again pieces which we had written together, and which at first had satisfied us, working in them for hours, for half a day at a time, with an almost angry persistency. You must remember, in short, that all our work, and in this perhaps consists its originality, and originality dearly bought, has its roots in nervous illness, that we drew our pictures of disease from our own experience, 
and that by dint of analyzing studying dissecting ourselves we at last attained a kind of superacute sensitiveness which was wounded on all sides by the infinite littleness of life i say we for when we wrote charles de Maly, i was more diseased than he alas he took the first place later on charles de Maly, it is a strange thing to write one's own history fifteen years in advance the obsession of genius sometimes attains such a point as actually to create a double personality and transform a philanthropist into an overbearing tyrant a melancholy man to a jovial reveller finally we have found even in the sanest most complete genius the incomplete and rudimentary forms of mania as melancholy megalomania hallucinations etc a fact which helps to explain the convictions of certain prophets and founders of dynasties convictions so deeply rooted as to serve the purpose of inspiration so far as the mass of the people were concerned Mosley says that one of the conditions essential to the originality of genius is a disposition to be dissatisfied with the existing state of things we have also met with the use of peculiar words which is so frequent a characteristic of modern mania and also those uncertainties which reach our extreme point to the madness of doubt the whole difference resolves itself at bottom into this that in sane genius the symptoms are less exaggerated the double personality is less conspicuous the choice of subjects connected with madness less frequent shakespeare concord and dubdet being exceptions and the note of absurdity less emphasized this however is scarcely ever wanting inasmuch as nothing is closer to the ridiculous than the sublime it is also not without importance to note that whenever genius appears in a race the number of the insane also increases of this fact we have found remarkable proofs among the italian german and english jews so much is this the case that it is the custom in germanic lunatic asylums to reckon genius in the parents among the aetiological elements of insanity both genius and insanity are influenced by violent passions at the time of conception by advanced age or alcoholism in the parents and as in all degenerate natures genius is only exceptionally transmitted it almost always assumes the form of more and more aggravated neurosis and rapidly disappears thanks to that beneficent sterility through which nature provides for the elimination of monsters though all the proofs we have given should have been forgotten the fact will be quite sufficiently demonstrated by the pedigrees of peter the great the caesars and charles v in which epileptics men of genius and criminals alternate with ever greater frequency till the line ends in idiocy and sterility in all these three types insanity insane genius insane genius we see at work with nearly equal intensity the influence of race of what climates of diminutions unless greatly exaggerated in the degree of atmospheric pressure and in frequent cases of maladies accompanied by a high temperature but the most convincing proof of all is offered by the insane who though not possessed of genius apparently acquire it for a time while under treatment these cases prove that geniality originality artistic and aesthetic creation may show themselves in the least predisposed natures as a consequence of mental alienation finally note the least important proof is contained in the singular phenomenon of the matoid who is distinguished from the really insane has all the appearances without the reality of genius taking all this into consideration we may confidently affirm that genius is a true degenerative psychosis belonging to the group of moral insanity and may temporarily spring out of other psychoses assuming their forms though keeping its own special peculiarities which distinguish it from all others the identity of genius with moral insanity is seen in that general alteration of the affective instincts which shows itself more or less disguised in all even in those rare altruistic persons with a genius for goodness to whom the name of saints has been given this also explains their longevity there is beyond all doubt some connection between all these observations and the fact established by tamburini and myself that the best artists of the asylum were all morally insane it should be remembered here that the clips were brigands and that the moral character of many great conquerors has been so far subject to alteration as to make of them true brigands on a large scale arved Barain, in noticing the beauty of countenance of certain brigands figured in my work in le humo delinquete has very justly observed that such a profession requires high intellectual endowments and precisely the same as those needed by conquerors who certainly have had no superabundance of moral sense history proves that the moral sense is in no degree a function of the intellect great men have been so often devoid of it that the world has been forced to invent for them a special morality which may be summed up in five words frequently uttered by such from napoleon down to bienvieto cellini everything is permitted to genius 
Men of genius are among the principal factors in true revolutions. History records as saying of Tarquin that for the preservation of despotism it was necessary to cut down the tallest heads. Carlo believed that the whole of history is that of great men. Emerson wrote that every new institution might be regarded as a prolonged shadow of some man of genius. Islamism of Mahomet, Protestantism of Calvin, Quakerism of Fox, Methodism of Wesley, Abolitionism of Clarkson, etc. Men of genius, wrote Fulbert, summarized in a single type, may separate personalities and bring new persons to consciousness in the human race. This is one of the causes of their immense influence, and not only are they not mere synistic, they are haters of old things and ardent lovers of the new and the unknown. Garibaldi, when he pushed on into almost unknown regions of America, said, I love the unknown. And Christ carried his idea of the new world that was about to appear as far as complete communism. Many men of genius rule beyond the tomb. Caesar was never so powerful, good Michelet, as when he was a corpse, and so William the Silent. Max Nordau even claims that all human progress is owing to despots of genius. Every revolution is the work of a minority whose individuality cannot conform to conditions which were neither calculated nor created for them. The only real innovator is known to history of tyrants, endowed with ability and knowledge. No revolution succeeds without a leader, wrote Machiavelli, and elsewhere. A minute without a head is useless. This is natural because the man of genius, being essentially original and a lover of originality, is a natural enemy of traditions and conservatism. He is the born revolutionary, the precursor and the most active pioneer of revolutions. End of section 17「Section 18 of the Man of Genius by Caesar Lombroso. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 3. The Epileptoid Nature of Genius. Aetology. Symptoms. Confessions of Men of Genius. The Life of a Great Epileptic. Napoleon, St. Paul, The Saints, Philanthropic Hysteria. We may, however, enter more deeply in the study of the phenomena of genius by the light of modern theories on epilepsy. According to the entirely harmonious researches of clinical and experimental observers, this malady resolves itself into localized irritation on the cerebral cortex, manifesting itself in attacks which are sometimes instantaneous, sometimes of a longer duration, but always intermittent and always resting on a degenerative basis, either hereditary or predisposed to irritation by alcoholic influence by lesions in the skull, etc. In this way we catch a glimpse of another conclusion, viz. that the creative power of genius may be a form of degenerative psychosis belonging to the family of epileptic affections. The fact that genius is frequently derived from parents either addicted to drink, of advanced age, or insane, certainly points to this conclusion, as also does the appearance of genius subsequently to lesions of the head. It is also indicated by frequent anomalies, especially of cranial asymmetry, the capacity of the skull being sometimes excessive, sometimes abnormally small, by the frequency of moral insanity and of hallucinations, by sexual and intellectual precocity, and not rarely by somnambulism. To these we may add the prevalence of suicide, which is on the other hand very common among epileptic patients, the intermittence of bodily and mental functions, more particularly the occurrence of amnesia and analgesia, the frequent tendency to vagabondage, religious feeling manifesting itself even in the case of atheists, as with Comte, the strange terrors by which they are often seized, W. Scott, Byron, Heller, the double personality, the multiplicity of simultaneous delusions, so common epileptic cases, the frequent recurrence of delusions produced by the most trifling causes, the same misonism, the same relation to criminality which finds its point of union in moral insanity and to this the origin and ancestry of criminals and imbeciles, which constantly show traces both of genius and epilepsy, as may be seen in the genealogical charts given of the families of the Caesars and Charles V, and the strange passion for wandering and for animals, which I have often found in degenerated and especially in epileptic subjects. The distractions of mind for which great men are so famous are often, writes Tonini, nothing else but epileptic absences. The greatest proof of all, however, is that effective insensibility and loss of moral sense common to all men of genius, whether sane or insane, which makes of great conquerors 
even in the most recent times, nothing else than brigands on a large scale. Such conclusions may seem strange to persons unacquainted with the way in which the region of epilepsy has been extended in modern times, so that many cases of headache, hemicrenia, or simple loss of memory are now recognized as forms of epilepsy, though in disguise, the manifestation, as Savage has observed, causing disappearance of every trace of the pre-existing epilepsy. It is sufficient, however, to recall to the reader the numerous men of genius of the first order who have been seized by motory epilepsy, or by that kind of morbid irritability which is well known to supply its place. Among these we find such names as Napoleon, Moliere, Julius Caesar, Petrarch, Peter the Great, Mahomet, Handel, Swift, Recalou, Charles V, Flaubert, Dostoevsky, and St. Paul. To those acquainted with the so-called binominal or serial law, according to which no phenomenon occurs singly, each one being, on the contrary, the expression of a series of less well-defined but unlegitimate facts, such frequent occurrence of epilepsy among the most distinguished or distinguished men can but indicate a greater prevalence of this disease among men of genius than was previously thought possible, and suggests a hypothesis of the epileptoid nature of genius itself. In this connection, it is important to note how, in these men, the convulsive made its appearance, but rarely in the course of their lives. Now it is well known that, in such cases, the psychic equivalent, here the exercise of creative power, is more frequent and intense. But above all, the identity is proved to us by the analogy of the epileptic seizure with the moment of inspiration. This active and violent unconsciousness in the one case manifests itself by creation and the other by motory agitation. The demonstration is completed when we come to analyse this creative inspiration or oestrus, which has often suggested epilepsy, even to those ignorant of the recent discoveries with regard to its nature, and this, not only on account of its frequent association with insensibility to pain, with the regularity of the pulse, and with an unconsciousness which is often that of a somnambulist, of its instantaneous occurrence in a demented character, but also because it is not seldom accompanied by convulsive movements of the limbs, followed by amnesia, and provoked by substances or conditions which cause or increase the excessive flow of blood to the brain, or by powerful sensations, and also because it may succeed or pass into hallucinations. This resemblance between inspiration and the epileptic seizure, moreover, is demonstrated by an even director and more cotton proof. The confessions of eminent men of genius, which show how completely the one may be confounded with the other, such confessions are those of Concord and Buffon, and especially Mohammed and Dostoevsky. There are moments, writes the latter in Bessie, that it is only a matter of five or six seconds when you suddenly feel the presence of the internal harmony. This phenomenon is neither terrestrial nor celestial, but it is an indescribable something which man, in his mortal body, can scarcely endure. He must either undergo a physical transformation or die. It is a clear, indisputable feeling all at once. You feel as though you were placed in contact with the whole of nature, and you say, Yes, this is true. When God created the world, he said, at the end of every day of creation, Yes, this is true, this is good, and it is not tenderness, nor yet joy. You not forgive anything, because there is nothing to forgive. Neither do you love. Oh, this feeling is higher than love. The terrible feeling is the frightful clearness with which it manifests itself, and the rapture with which it fills you. If this state were to last more than five seconds, the soul could not endure it, and would have to disappear. During those five seconds, I live a whole human existence, and for that I would give my whole life, and not think I was paying it too dearly. Are you an epileptic? No. You will become so. I have heard that it begins just in that way. A man subject to this malady has minutely described to me the sensation which precedes the attack and in listening to you, I thought I heard him speaking. He too spoke of a period of five seconds, and said it was impossible to endure this condition longer. Remember Mahomet's water jar? For the space of time it took to empty it, the prophet was wrapped into paradise. Your five seconds are the jar. Paradise is your harmony. And Mahomet was epileptic. Take care, you do not become so also. Kirillov. And in The Idiot, Volume 1, page 296. I remember, among other things, a phenomenon which used to precede his epileptic attacks, when they came on in a waking state, in the midst of the dejection, the mental marasmus, the anxiety which the madman experienced, 
there were moments in which all of a sudden his brain became inflamed and all his vital forces suddenly rose to a prodigious degree of intensity the sensation of life the conscious existence was multiplied almost tenfold in these swiftly passing moments a strange light illuminated his heart and mind all agitation was calmed all doubt and perplexity resolved itself into a superior harmony a serene and tranquil gaiety which yet was completely rational but these ready moments were only a prelude to the last incident then immediately succeeded by the attack that instant was in truth ineffable when at a later time after his recovery the prince reflected on this subject he said to himself those fleeting moments in which our highest consciousness of ourselves and therefore our highest life is manifested are due only to disease to the suspension of normal conditions and if so it is not a higher life but on the contrary of a lower order this however did not prevent his reaching a most paradoxical conclusion what matter after all there would be a disease at abnormal tension if the result as i with recovered health remember and analyse it includes the very highest degree of harmony and beauty if at this moment i have an unspeakable hitherto unsuspected feeling of harmony of peace of my whole nature being fused in the impetus of prayer with the highest synthesis of life this farrago of nonsense seemed to the prince perfectly comprehensible and the only fault it had in his eyes was that of being too feeble a rendering of his thoughts he could not doubt or even admit the possibility of doubt of the real existence of this condition of beauty and prayer or of its constituting the highest synthesis of life but did he not in these moments experience visions analogous to the fantastic and debasing dreams produced by the intoxication of opium hashish or wine he was able to form a sane judgment on this point when the morbid condition had ceased these moments were only distinguished to define them in a word by the extraordinary heightening of the inward sense if in that instant that is to say in the last moment of consciousness which precedes the attack the patient was able to say clearly and with full consciousness of the import of his words yes for this moment one would give a whole lifetime there is no doubt that as far as he alone was concerned that moment was worth a lifetime no doubt too it is to this same instant that the epileptic mohammed allude when he said that he used to visit all the abodes of allah in less time than it would take to empty his water jar i will add here some lines from the correspondence of Lobert. if sensitive nerves are enough to make a poet i should be worth more than shakespeare and homer i have heard through closed doors people talking in low tones thirty paces away across whose abdomen one may see all the viscera throbbing and who have sometimes felt in the space of a minute a million thoughts images and combinations of all kinds throwing themselves into my brain at once as it were the lighted squibs of fireworks let us now compare these descriptions of an attack which might be called one of psychic epilepsy and which corresponds exactly to the physiological idea of epilepsy i.e. cortical irritation with all the descriptions given us by authors themselves of the inspiration of genius we should then see how perfect is the correspondence between the two sets of phenomena in order the better to illustrate these strange displacements of functions in epileptic subjects i should call attention to an example cited by dr frigerio of an epileptic patient who at the moment of seizure felt the venereal desire awaken not in the generative organs but in the epigastrium accompanied by ejaculation let me add that in certain cases it is not only isolated paroxysms which recall the psychic phenomenology of the epileptic but the whole life bolger remarks that for the concords life reduces itself to a series of epileptic attacks preceded and followed by a blank and what the concords wrote has always been autobiography zola in his romancius naturalistis gives us the confessions of Wolzak. he works under the influence of circumstances of which the union is a mystery he does not belong to himself he is the plaything of a force which is eminently capricious on some days he would not touch his brush he would not write a line for an empire in the evening when dreaming in the morning when rising in the midst of some joyous feast it happens that a burning coal suddenly touches his brain these hands this tongue a word awakens ideas that are born grow ferment such is the artist the humble instrument of a despotic will he obeys a master let us glance at the pictures which taine has given us of the greatest of modern conquerors and renan of the greatest of the apostles 
The principal characteristics of Napoleon's genius, says Taine, are its originality and comprehensiveness. No detail escapes him. The quality of facts which his mind stores up and retains, the number of ideas which he elaborates and utters, seem to surpass human capacity. In the art of ruling men, his genius was supreme. His method of procedure, which is that of the experimental sciences, consisted in controlling every theory by a precise application observed under definite conditions. All his sayings are fire flashes. Adultery, said he to the Conseil de that, when the question of divorce was under discussion, is not exceptional, it is very common. Siesta une affaire de canapé. Liberty, he exclaimed on another occasion, and he remained faithful all his life to the spirit of this exclamation, is a necessity of a small and privileged class, endowed by nature, with faculties higher than those of the mass of mankind. It may therefore be abridged with impunity. Equality, on the contrary, pleases the multitude. He possesses a faculty which carries us back to the Middle Ages, an astounding constructive imagination. What he accomplished is surprising, but he undertook far more, and dreamed much more even than that. However vigorous his practical faculties may have been, his poetic faculty was still stronger. It was even greater than it ought to have been in a statesman. We see greatness in him exaggerated to eat into immensity and immensity degenerated into madness. What aspiring monstrous conceptions revolved, accumulated, supersede each other in that marvellous brain, Europe, he said, is a molehill. There have never been great empires or great revolutions save at the East, where there are six hundred millions of men. In Egypt he was thinking of conquering Syria, re-establishing the Eastern Empire at Constantinople, and returned to Paris by way of Adrianople and Vienna. The East allured him with the mirage omnipotence. In the East he caught a glimpse of the possibility that, a new Mohammed, he might found a new religion. Confined to Europe, his dream was to recreate the empire of Charlemagne, to make Paris the physical, intellectual, and religious capital of Europe, and assemble within its precincts the princes, kings, and popes, who should have become his vassals. By way of Russia, he would then advance towards the Ganges and the supremacy of India. The artist enclosed within the politician, as issued from his sheath, he creates in the religion of the ideal and the impossible. We know him for what he is, a posthumous brother of Dante and Michelangelo. Only these two worked on paper and in marble. He was a living man, sensitive and suffering flesh, that formed his material. Napoleon differs from the modern men in character, as much to the contemporaries of Dante and Michelangelo. The sentiments, habits, and morality professed by him are the sentiments, habits, and morality of the 15th century. I am not a man like other men, he exclaimed. The laws of morality and decorum are not made for me. Me, Distal, and Sadhel compared Napoleon psychologically to the lesser tyrants of the 14th century, Savorza and Casturcio, Castracani. Such, in fact, he was. On the evening of the 12th, Vendemeyer, being present at the preparations made by the sections, he said to Junot, Ah, if the sections would only place me at their head. I would answer for it that they should be in the Tullys within two hours, then all these wretched conventionalists out of it. Five hours later, being called to the assistance of Barras and the convention, he opened fire on the Parisians, like a good conteteur, who does not give but lends himself to the first who offers, to the highest bidder, reserving for himself full liberty of action and the power of seizing everything should the occasion present itself. Never even among the Bordiers and Malatestas was there a more sensitive and impulsive brain, capable of such electric accumulations and discharges? In him, no idea remained purely speculative. Each one, as it occurred, had a tendency to embody itself in action, and would have done so if not prevented by force. Sometimes the outburst was so sudden that restraint did not come in time. One day in Egypt, he upset a decanter of water over a lady's dress, and taking her into his own room under the pretext of remedying the accident, remained there with her for some time, too long while the other guests, seated around the table, waited, gazing at each other. On another occasion, he threw Prince Louis violently out of the room, and yet another, he kicked Senator Volney in the stomach. At a camp of Wormino, he threw down and broke a china ornament, to put an end to the resistance of the Austrian plenipotentiary, at Dresden in 1813, when Prince Metternich was most necessary to him. He asked him, brutally, how much he received from England for defending her interests. Never was there a more impatient sensibility. He throws garments that do not fit him into the fire. 
his writing when he tries to write is a collection of disconnected and indecipherable characters he dictates so quickly that his secretaries can scarcely follow him if the pen is beat high hand so much the worse for it if a volley of oaths and exclamations give it time to catch up so much the better his heart and intellect are full to overflowing under pressure like this the extempore orator and the excited controversialists take the place of the statesman my nerves are irritable he said of himself and in fact the tension of accumulated impressions sometimes produced a physical convulsion he was not seldom seen to shed tears under strong emotion napoleon wept not on account of true and deep feeling but because a word an idea by itself is a stimulus which reaches the inmost depth of his nature and certain distractions consequent upon vomitings or fainting fits which caused it is said the loss of general Vedemain's corpse after the battle of dresden though the regular is so powerful the balance of the works is from time to time in danger of being deranged an enormous degree of strength was necessary to coordinate to guide and to dominate passions of such vitality in napoleon this strength is an instinct of extraordinary force and harshness an egoism not inert but active and aggressive and so far developed as to set up in the midst of human society a colossal eye which can tolerate no life that is not an appendix or instrument of its own even as a child he showed the germs of this personality he was impatient of all restraint and had no trace of conscience he could brook no rivals beat those who refused to render homage to him and accuse his victims of having beaten him he looks upon the world as a great banquet open to every comer but where to be well served it is necessary for a man to have long arms help himself first and let others take what he leaves one has a hold over man through his selfish patterns fear greed sensuality self-esteem emulation if there are some hard particles in the heap all one has to do is to crush them such was a final conception arrived at by napoleon and nothing could induce him to change it because this conception is conditioned by his character he saw man as he needed to see him his egoism is reflected in his ambition so much a part of his inmost nature that he cannot distinguish it from himself it makes his head swim france is a mistress who is his to enjoy in the exercise of his power he acknowledges neither intermediaries nor rivals nor limits nor hindrances to fill his office with zeal and success it is not enough for him above and beyond the functionary he vindicates the rights of the man all who serve him must extinguish the critical sense in themselves that scarcely audible whispers are a conspiracy or an attack on his majesty he requires of them anything and everything from the manufacture of false austrian and russian banknotes in eighteen o nine to eighteen twelve to the preparation of an infernal machine to blow up the bourbons in eighteen fourteen he knows nothing of gratitude when a man is of no further use to him as a tool he throws him away during a dance he would walk about among the ladies in order to shock them with unpleasant witticisms he was always prying into their private life and related to the empress herself the favours which more or less spontaneously they granted him while still stranger he carried the same methods of proceeding into his relations with sovereigns and ambassadors of foreign states in his correspondence his proclamations his audiences he provoked threatened challenged offended he divulged their real or supposed amorous intrigues the bulletins nine seventeen eighteen nineteen after the battle of jena evidently accused the queen of prussia of having had an intrigue with the emperor alexander and reproaches them with a personal insult to himself in the employment of such or such a man he requires them in short to modify their functional laws he is but a poor opinion of a government or the power of prohibiting things which may displease foreign governments this is the completest view of napoleon ever given by any historian to any one acquainted with the psychological constitution of the epileptic it becomes clear that taine has here given us the subtlest and precisest pathological diagnosis of a case of psychic epilepsy with its gigantic megalomaniacal illusions its impulses and complete absence of moral sense it is not therefore only in moments of inspiration that genius approaches epilepsy and the same thing may be said of st paul st paul was of low stature but stoutly made his health was always poor on account of a strange infirmity which he calls a thorn in the flesh and which was probably a serious neurosis his moral character was anomalous naturally kind and courteous he became ferocious when excited by passion in the school of gamaliel a moderate pharisee he did not learn moderation as the enthusiastic leader of the young pharisees he was among the fiercest persecutors of the christians 
hearing that there was a certain number of disciples at damascus he demanded the high priest a warrant for arresting them and left jerusalem in a disturbed state of mind on approaching the pain of damascus at noon he had a seizure evidently of an epileptic nature in which he fell to the ground unconscious soon after this he experienced a hallucination and saw jesus himself who said to him in hebrew paul paul why persecutest thou me for three days seized with fever he neither ate nor drank and saw the phantom of ananias whom as head of the christian community he had come to arrest making signs to him the latter was summoned to his bed and calm immediately returned to the spirit of paul who from that day forward became one of the most fervent christians without desiring any more special instruction as having received a direct revelation from christ himself he regarded himself as one of the apostles and as such to the enormous advantage of the christians the immense dangers occasioned by this haughty and arrogant spirit were compensated a thousand times over by his boldness and originality which would not allow the christian idea to remain within the bounds of a small association of people poor in spirit who would have let it die out like hellenism but so to speak steered boldly out to sea with it in antioch he had an hallucination similar to that of mohammed at a later period he felt himself wrapped into the third heaven where he heard unspeakable words which is not lawful for a man to utter anomalies are also observed in his writings he lets himself be guided by words rather than ideas some one word which he has in his mind overpowers him and draws him off into a series of ideas very far removed from his main subject his digresses are abrupt the development of his ideas is suddenly cut short his sentences are often unfinished no writer was ever so unequal no literature in the world presents a sublime passage like one corinthians thirteen side by side with futile arguments and wearisome detail epilepsy in men of genius therefore is not an accidental phenomenon but true morbus totius substantiae to express it in medical language hence we gather a fresh indication of the epileptoid nature of genius if it seems certain dostoevsky described himself in the idiot we have another example of an epileptic genius whose whole course of life is determined by the psychology peculiar to the epileptic impulsivity double personality childishness which goes back even to the earliest periods of human life and alternates with the prophetic penetration and with morbid altruism and the exaggerated effectivity of the saint this last fact is more important as bearing on the objection that the usual immortality of the epileptic would forbid us to connect this type with that of the saintly character this objection however can be partially eliminated by the researchers bianchi tonini filippi according to whom there are cases though rare sixteen per cent of epileptic patients of good character who is even manifest an exaggerated altruism though accompanied by excessive emotionism hysteria which is closely related to epilepsy and similarly connected with the loss of affectivity often shows us side by side with an exaggerated egoism certain bursts of excessive altruism which at the same time have their source in and depend on a degree of moral insanity and shows us the morbid phenomenon in excessive charity there are some ladies justly observed le grand du soil who though remaining in the world take an ostentatious part in all the good works going on in their parish they collect for the poor work for the orphans visit the sick give alms watch the dead idly solicit the benevolence of others and do a great deal of really helpful work while at the same time neglecting their husbands children and household affairs these women ostentatiously and noisily proclaim their benevolence they set on foot a work of charity with as much ardour as burgers company promoters launch a financial surprise which is a result of hyperbolical dividends they go and come in in constantly increasing numbers they instinctively act with a charming tact and delicacy think of everything necessary to be done whether in the midst of private mourning or public catastrophe and affect a blush on receiving tribunes of admiration from grateful sufferers or deeply moved spectators their ready tact and sympathy are surprising and the greater the trouble the more admirably do they seem to rise to the occasion for the paroxysm lasts when their feelings are calmed the benevolent impulse passes away being essentially mobile and spasmodic they cannot do good deliberately and on reflection the charitable hysteric is capable of achieving feats of courage which have been quoted and repeated and even become legendary they have been known to show extraordinary presence of mind resource and courage in saving the inmates of a burning house or in facing an armed mob during a riot if questioned on the following day 
These heroines will be found in a state of complete prostration, and some of them candidly avow that they do not know what they have done, and were at the time unconscious of danger. At a time of cholera epidemic, when fear causes such ill-advised and reprehensible derelictions of duty, hysterical women have been known to show an extraordinary devotion. Nothing is repugnant to them. Nothing revolts their modesty or wearies out their endurance. For such persons, devotion to others has become a need, a necessary expenditure of energy, and without knowing it, they pathologically play the part of virtue. People in general are taken in by it, and for the sake of example, it is just as well. It was this consideration which induced me to ask and obtain a public acknowledgement of the services of a hysterical patient, at one time an inmate of a lunatic asylum, whose deeds of charity in the district where she lives are truly touching. While constantly active in attendance on the sick, and spending liberally on their behalf, she confines the personal expenditure to what is strictly necessary, her dress being the same at all seasons of the year. Now this lady shows a great variety of hysterical symptoms, becomes intensely excited on the slightest occasion, sleeps very badly, and is a serious invalid. Lastly, in private sorrows, the hysterical patient often departs from the normal manifestations of grief. At the loss of her children, she remains calm, serene, resigned, does not shed a tear, thinks everything that ought to be done, gives numerous orders, forgets none of the most painful details, imposes on all around her the most dignified attitude, and attends the funeral without breaking down. People think that this mother is exceptionally gifted, and has a courage superior to others. This is a mistake. She is weaker than they. She is suffering from disease. In order fully to grasp the seeming paradoxes contained in these conclusions, we must remember that many philanthropists love their neighbours, but only at a distance, and nearly always at the expense of the more physiological, more general affections, love for the family, their country, etc. We must remember Dostoevsky's remark in the brothers Karamanzov, 1, page 325, that what one can love in one's fellow is a hidden and invisible man. As soon as he shows his face, love disappears. One can love one's fellow men in spirit, but only at a distance, never close at hand. One also recalls Stern, who was overcome with emotion at the sight of a dead ass and deserted his wife and his mother. The great philanthropists, such men as Beccaria and Howard, have been harsh fathers and masters. Even the divine philanthropist was, as we have seen, hard towards his own family. St. Paul, before his conversion, distinguished himself by his vehement and cruel persecutions of the Christians. It is well known how, only too often, the man of real and fervent religion has to forget his family and make a duty of celibacy and hatred to the other sex. Thus St. Liberada was angry with her husband for weeping at parting from their children, and according to the legend, the mother of Baruch replied to her son when, during his martyrdom, he implored her for water in his anguish. Thou shouldst desire no water, now save that of heaven. These cases, moreover, show that very often, exaggerated altruism is itself only a pathological phenomenon. A hypertrophy of sentiment accompanied, as always happens in cases of hypertrophy, by loss and atrophy in other directions. We have seen in Juan de Dios, in Lazaretti, Leula, and St. Francis of Assisi, St. Linus showing itself in true psychic polarization as a perfect contrast to the former life in which the tendency to evil was strongly pronounced. If we add to these phenomena, so frequent in epileptic and hysterical patients, all those others of clairvoyance, thought transference, transposition of the senses, facadism, mental vision, temporary manifestations of genius, and monoidism, so frequently observed in these maladies, phenomena so strange that many scientists are able to explain endeavour to deny them, we can demonstrate the hysterical character of saintliness, even its least explicable manifestations, those miracles. End of section 18「Section 19 of the Man of Genius by Caesar Lombroso. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information on the volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 4. Same Men of Genius. Their unperceived defects. Reculeau. Sesosteris. Foscolo. Michelangelo. Darwin. But a graver objection is that afforded by those few men of genius who have completed their intellectual orbit without aberration, neither depressed by misfortune nor thrown out of their course by madness. Such have been Galileo, Leonardo da Vinci, Voltaire, Machiavelli, 
Michelangelo, Darwin. Each one of these showed, by the ample volume and at the same time the symmetrical proportion of the skull, force of intellect restrained by the calm of the desires. Not one of them allowed his great passion for truth and beauty to stifle the love of family and country. They never changed their faith or character, never swerved from their aim, never left their work half completed. What assurance, what faith, what ability they showed in their undertakings, and above all, what moderation and unity of character they preserved in their lives though they too had to experience, after undergoing the sublime paroxysm of inspiration, the torture inflicted by ignorant hatred, and the discomfort of uncertainty and exhaustion, they never, on that account, deviated from the straight road. They carried out to the end the one cherished idea which formed the aim and purpose of their lives, calm and serene, never complaining of obstacles, and falling into a few mistakes, mistakes which, in lesser men, might even have passed for discoveries. But I have already answered, in the opening pages of this book, the objection furnished by these rare exceptions, pointing out that epilepsy and moral insanity, which is its first variety, often pass unobserved, not only in distinguished men, the prestige of whose name and work dazzles our judgment, and prevents our discerning them, but in those criminals to whom such researchers might at least restore self-respect, by depriving them of all responsibility. Who, but for the revelations of some of his intimate friends would have suspected that Cavour was repeatedly subject to attacks of suicidal mania, or thought that Raikalu was epileptic. No one would have paid any attention to the morbid impulsiveness of Foscolo, or recorded as a symptom, if Davies had not examined his skull after death. Who could make any assertion with regard to the moral sense of Cesorstis? Yet, as Arved Barain justly remarks, his skull clearly corresponds with the criminal type. The low and narrow forehead, prominent superciliary arc, thick eyebrows, eyes set close together, long, narrow, aquiline nose, hollow temples, projecting cheekbones, strong jaws, the expression not intelligent, but animal, fierce, proud, and majestic, the head small in proportion to the body, are all so many indications of the most complete absence of moral sense. In all the biographies of Michelangelo, we do not discover one spot on that gentle yet robust soul who trembled for the sorrows of his country as at the expression of beauty. But the publication of his letters, and the keen researches of Padre Greco, have revealed physical anomalies never before suspected. One of the most important is his complete indifference to women. This may be observed in his works, and his masterpieces were all masculine. Moses, Lorenzo, Giuliano de Medici, etc. He never used, it appears, the living female model, though he made use of corpses. His bacchanet is a virago with masculine muscles, unformed breasts, and no feminine touch. In his many love sonnets, written rather to follow the prevailing fashion than from any true inspiration of passion, none bear the mark of being addressed to real women. Only fourteen times, it is said, does the word Donna occur. On the other hand, in the Barbera collection, sonnets eighteen and twelve show a very marked admiration for the male, and Varakai considers that these are addressed to Cavalere, who was of great physical beauty. There are in existence two of his letters addressed to Cavalieri, July 28, 1523, and July 28, 1532, which seem to be written to a mistress, and in which, humiliating himself, he swears that, if banished from the other's heart, he will die. There is a similar letter written to Angelini. This moral anomaly, which he would share with many artists, Cellini, Sodoma, etc., is not the only one to meet with. In his letters, writes Per de la Greco, may be seen constant contradictions between ideas that are great and generous, and others which are puerile, between will and speech, between thought and action, extreme irritability, inconstant affection, great activity in doing good, sudden sympathies, great outbursts of enthusiasm, great fears, sometimes unconsciousness of his own actions, marvellous modesty in the field of art, unreasonable vanity in the appearance of life. These are the various psychical manifestations in life of Buonarroti, which lead me to believe that the great artist was affected by a neuropathic condition bordering on hysteria. Every day in his old age he discovered some sin in his past life, and he sent money to France for masses to be said, have her arms to the poor, and to enable poor girls to be married, and, which is stranger, to be made nuns. All this was to gain paradise. Letter 187, 214, 240, 330. To save his soul, he who had said, It is not strange that the monks should spoil a chapel at the Vatican, since they have known how to spoil the whole world. At some moments, 
he feels that his conscience is clean and then he desires to die so that he may not fall back into evil but then his discouragement returns and he believes strange blasphemy that it was a sin to have been born an artist conosco di quen terra terra carca le fatusa fantasia che la art mi fec itoro e monaca li perol del mondo mi hanno troto il tempo dato e contemplare dio and he believes himself destined by god to a long life simply that he may complete the fabric of st peter's in old age he who had shown so little vanity where his work was concerned and so much modesty in speaking of it went about studying how he could best exhibit the nobility of his descent claiming to trace in a direct line from the counts of canossa a claim which even valid would not be worth a finger of his moses michelangelo tenderly loved his father and brother and nephews and enabled them to live in easy circumstances yet in his letters to them he frequently shows himself suspicious and treats them unjustly in fifteen forty four he fell seriously ill at rome his nephew naturally hastened to his bedside michelangelo became very angry and wrote you have come to kill me and to see when i leave behind know that i have made my will and that there is nothing here for you to think about therefore go in peace and do not write to me more three months after he changed his tone i will not fail in what i have often thought about that is in helping you he has himself left a confession of his almost morbid melancholy in a letter ninety seven to sebastino del piombo yesterday evening i was happy because i escaped from my mad and melancholy humour without the recent biographical and autobiographical notes published by his son no one could have imagined that darwin a model father and citizen to self-controlled and even so free from vanity was a neuropath his son tells us that for forty years he never enjoyed twenty-four hours of health like other men of the eight years devoted to the study of the cirripedes two as he himself writes were lost through illness like all neuropaths he could bear neither heat nor cold half an hour of conversation beyond his habitual time was sufficient to cause insomnia and hinder his work on the following day he suffered also from dyspepsia a spinal anemia and giddiness which last is known to be frequently the equivalent of epilepsy and he could not work more than three hours a day he had curious crotchets finding that eating sweets made him ill he resolved not to touch them again but was unable to keep his resolution unless he had repeated it aloud he had a strange passion for paper writing the rough drafts of his correspondence on the back of proof sheets and of the most important m s s which thus rendered difficult to decipher he often instituted what he himself called fool's experiments e g having a bassoon played close to the cotyledons of a plant when about to make an experiment he seemed to be urged on by some inward force from a morbid dislike to novelty he used the millimetric tables of an old book which he knew to be inaccurate but to which he was accustomed he would not change his old chemical balance though aware that it was untrustworthy he refused to believe in hypnotism and also at first in the discovery of prehistoric stone weapons he frequently says his daughter inverted his sentences both in speaking and writing and had a difficulty in pronouncing some letters especially w like skoda rikitansky and socrates he had a short snub nose and his ears were large and long nor were degenerative characteristics wanting among his ancestors it is true that he reckoned among them several men of intellect and almost genius which as robert sixteen eighty two a botanist and intelligent observer and edward author of a gameskeeper's manual full of acute observations on animals his father had great powers of observation but his paternal grandfather erasmus poet and naturalist at the same time had a passionate temper and an impediment to his speech one of his sons charles a poet and collector resembled him in this respect finally another uncle erasmus a man of some intellect a numismatist and statistician ended by madness and suicide it might be objected that the fact of such different forms of psychosis melancholy moral insanity monomania being found either complete or undeveloped in men of genius excludes the special psychosis of genius and still more that of epilepsy but it may be answered that recent research which has enlarged the domain of epilepsy has also demonstrated that apart from impulsive and hallucinatory delusions epilepsy may be superadded to any form of mental alienation especially megalomania and moral insanity and as is the case in nearly all degenerative psychoses undeveloped forms of mental disease and recurring multiform delusions brought on by the most trivial causes especially predominate in epilepsy 
End of section 19. Section 20 of The Man of Genius by Cesar Lombroso. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 5. Conclusions. Between the physiology of the man of genius, therefore, and the pathology of the insane, there are many points of coincidence. There is even actual continuity. This fact explains frequent occurrence of bad men of genius, and men of genius who have become insane, having, it is true, characteristics special to themselves, but capable of being resolved into exaggerations of those of genius pure and simple. The frequency of delusions in their multiform characters of degenerative characteristics, of the loss of activity, of hereditary, more particularly in the children of inebriate, imbecile, idiotic, or epileptic parents, and above all, the peculiar character of inspiration, show that genius is a degenerative psychosis of the epileptoid group. This supposition is confirmed by the frequency of a temporary manifestation of genius in the insane, and by the new group of matoids to whom disease gives all the semblance of genius without its substance. What I have hitherto written may, I hope, or remaining within the limits of psychological observation, afford an experimental starting point for a criticism of artistic and literary, sometimes also of scientific creations. Thus, in the fine arts, exaggerated mere use of detail, the abuse of symbols, inscriptions or accessories, a preference for some one particular colour, an unrestrained passion for mere novelty, may approach the morbid symptoms of matoidism. Just so, in literature and science, a tendency to puns and plays upon words, an excessive fondness for symptoms, a tendency to speak for oneself and substitute epigram for logic, an extreme predilection for the rhythm and antecedences of verse and prose writing, even an exaggerated degree of originality may be considered as morbid phenomena. So also is a mania of writing in biblical form, in detached verses, and with special favourite words, which are underlined or repeated many times, and a certain graphic symbolism. Here I must acknowledge that, when I see how many of the organs which claim to do direct public opinion are infected with this tendency, and how often young writers undertake to discuss grave social problems in their capricious phraseology of the lunatic asylum, and the disjointed periods of biblical times, as though our robust lungs were unable to cope with the vigorous and manly inspirations of the Latin instruction. I feel grave apprehensions for the future of the rising generation. On the other hand, the analogy of Matoids of genius, whose morbid phenomena only are inherited by them, and with sane persons with whom they have shrewdness and practical sense in common, or to put students on their guard against certain systems, spring up by the hundreds, or particularly in the abstract or inexact sciences, and due to the efforts of men incompetent, or my lack either of capacity or knowledge of the subject to deal with them. In these systems, declamation, assonances, paradoxes, and conceptions, often original, but always incomplete and contradictory, take the place of calm reasoning based on a minute and unprejudiced study of facts. Such books are nearly always the work of those true, though involuntary charlatans, the matoys, who are more widely diffused in the literary world than is commonly supposed. Nor is it only students who should be on their guard against them, but especially politicians. Not that in an age of free criticism like our own there is any danger that these pretended reformers, who are stimulated and guided solely by mental disease, should be taken seriously, but the obstacles justly opposed to them may, by irritating, sharpen and complete their insanity, transforming a harmless delusion, whether ideological, as in the case of most metoids, or sensorial, as in monomaniacs into active madness, in which their greater intellectual power, the depth and tendency of their convictions, and that very excess of altruism which compels them to occupy themselves with public affairs, render them more dangerous and more inclined to rebellion and regicide than other insane persons. When we reflect that, on the other hand, a genuine lunatic may give proof of temporary genius, a phenomenon calculated to inspire the populace with an astonishment which soon produces veneration, we find a solid argument against those jurists and judges who, from the soundness and activity of the intellect, infer complete moral responsibility to the total exclusion of the possibility of insanity. We also see our way to an interpretation of the mystery of genius, its contradictions, and those of its mistakes, which an ordinary man would have avoided. And we can explain to ourselves how it is that madmen or matoys, even with little or no genius, 
Pasinante, Lazaretti, Trebisius, Fortier, Fox, have been able to excite the populace, and sometimes even bring about serious political revolutions. Better still shall we understand how those who were at once men of genius and insane, Mohammed, Luther, Savonarola, Schopenhauer, could, despising and overcoming obstacles which would have dismayed any cool and deliberate mind, hastened by whole centuries of unfolding of truth, how such men have originated nearly all the religions, and certainly all the sects, which have agitated the world. The frequency of genius among lunatics and of madmen among men of genius explains the fact that the density of nations has often been in the hands of the insane, and shows how the latter have been able to contribute so much to the progress of mankind. In short, by these analogies, and coincidences between the phenomena of genius and mental aberration, it seems as though nature had intended to teach us respect for the supreme misfortunes of insanity, and also to preserve us from being dazzled by the brilliancy of those men of genius who might well be compared, not to the planets which keep their appointed orbits, but to falling stars, lost and dispersed over the crust of the earth. End of Conclusions End of Section 20 and end of the man of genius by Caesar Lombroso. Recorded by Leon Harvey.